Chapter Zero of Notes on the Broads and Rivers of Norfolk and Suffolk. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Notes on the Broads and Rivers of Norfolk and Suffolk by Harry Britton. Chapter Zero Preface in one of the early issues of hood's annual the great humorist said in his introduction it would be very desirable if one could serve a preface as ulysses treated polyphemus and knock its eye out in my own case the personal pronoun must of necessity run through the whole work although in writing it i frequently wished this could be dispensed with very probably as a result of the publication of this guide a good many of the public will be induced to visit the broads and rivers in the coming summer to any such who really come to norfolk i wish in this most prominent page to say that all the broads are not free and that although a quiet row is not as a rule objected to fishing is strictly prohibited on private waters piscators need not think however that they had better be on the right side and keep away altogether as nowhere in england can better free fishing be found and as a matter of fact the law of trespass need not be infringed to secure fine catches i am conscious that there may be many deficiencies in my book and although i have endeavoured to give information on every point i may have left out some details which should have received attention if such there be i wish to say it will afford me very great pleasure to answer any letters on the subject from bona fide intending tourists merely hinting that such inquiries must be of as general a character as possible most likely in the future i may have something more to say on our east anglian lakeland and i should be glad to receive any information on the subject in all its various bearings harry Britton, norwich may eighteen eighty seven end of chapter zero chapter one of notes on the broads and rivers of norfolk and suffolk by harry Britton. this librivox recording is in the public domain introductory perhaps the best place to get an idea of the magnificent heritage of waters of which we norfolk men are so proud to boast is from galston pierhead a stranger to the district who takes his stand at the point i have indicated will be struck by the enormous volume of water the ebb brings down and which there weds itself to the ocean enormous indeed is the only word which adequately describes the torrent of the rivers which thus find outlet to the sea i shall have something to say very shortly but it will probably be hardly credited that the united drainage of no less an area than one thousand four hundred square miles is represented by the yare as it empties at yarmouth the rivers are navigable for about two hundred miles of their courses and are supplemented at various points by large freshwater lakes locally known as broads which are computed to cover five thousand acres frequent notices in all the leading daily and weekly papers and magazines have helped to make these waters very popular of late years and the broads and rivers of norfolk and suffolk are now firmly established as a holiday resort several guides of which only one can really claim to be authoritative 
have also materially conduced to popularise the district. In the present work, I intend giving an account of a trip I took in my yacht, the Buttercup, last season, accompanied by a friend who is quite as enthusiastic on Norfolk yachting as I am. I have thought it better to give all the information I can in the narrative itself, as to cut the subject up and tabulate the various details would constitute a task as distasteful as I anticipate my own plan will be otherwise. The streams of Norfolk and Suffolk, which flow into the sea at Yarmouth, are seven in number. Three of these, the Yare, Waveney, and Bure, may be considered main rivers, and I will endeavour to give a rough idea of their relative positions in the order named, which the general chart accompanying this book will help to make understood. The Yare, to which all the others are tributary, rises at Shipdom, and becomes a navigable stream at Trails Hythe, about two miles from Norwich, where it is joined by the Wensum. It then flows in a southeasterly direction as far as Reedham, just above which it is supplemented by a tiny stream coming from Loddon called the Chet. From Reedham, the Yare takes a sudden turn, and for the rest of its course to Yarmouth, runs to the northeast. The river that now claims our attention is the Waveney, which, rising in Lopham Fen, becomes a navigable stream at Bungay and joins the main river at Borough Flats. Its navigable course is 48 miles. Last, but certainly not least, either in size or interest, on our list, is the Bure which springs into existence at Briston and Hilverston. This river is navigable for craft of very light draught from Buxton downwards. Its course is generally southeasterly, till its waters become mingled in the air at the extreme east of Braden Water at Yarmouth. This stream, with its two tributaries, the Ant and Thurn, drains what may be called the broad district proper, as by far the greater number of these lakes are reached by means of the rivers mentioned. Having thus roughly disposed of the watercourses, I will endeavour to show how the broads are distributed. Although finally receiving all their waters, the Yare can only claim two, Surlingham and Rockland. The Lothingland district also has two, Alton and Fritton. The North River section is, as I have already said, very much the most extensive. Connected directly with this stream is a line of broads stretching from South Walsham to Wroxham, a distance of ten miles. The Ant drains a beautiful lake called Barton, and a very much smaller one, named after the village of Stalham, from which it is separated by a dyke. The Thurn, or Hundred Stream, receives the waters of Hickling, Horsey Mere, Higham Sounds, Somerton, Womack, etc. Last for our consideration is the Philby, Ormsby and Rollsby section, which finds outlet to the Bure below Acle Bridge through a channel called the Muckfleet. Having gained a little idea of some of the waterways of Norfolk and Suffolk, and made up his mind to spend his holiday thereon, the reader will probably inquire where he is to go for a ship in which to make the journeys. Alton, Norwich, Yarmouth, and Wroxham are the chief letting centres, and a yacht to accommodate three or four with all the necessary culinary utensils, plate, table linen, etc., may be hired for five guineas or five pound five shillings a week, which, I should add, includes the man's wages and use of dinghy.
if a large party is being made up of say ten or a dozen the norfolk wherry is the most suitable craft afloat these barges are as comfortable as a thames houseboat with the great added advantage of affording extreme facility for getting from place to place the charm which female society adds to everything can also by their means be enjoyed as in all the wherries separate apartments are devoted to ladies use in the main cabins i had almost written state cabins so nicely are some furnished and decorated i know of one which is actually panelled in oak a piano is generally to be found and on the inevitable wet day a capital stove provides the good companionable friend which afloat as well as ashore is so much appreciated by comfort loving englishmen of course as a yacht owner i very much prefer the fun of sailing a cutter to a wherry although even in the latter i have enjoyed great excitement sometimes but on one point i am bound to admit our larger rivals beat us this consists in their ability to explore the most remote parts of the district in my own craft i can go almost everywhere but must confess myself outdone in this particular by many a wherry of three or four times the buttercup's tonnage the way in which the number of wherry yachts has multiplied within the last three seasons is excellent proof of their popularity and a description of the best if not the largest specimen of these floating hotels may be deemed of interest the craft i refer to is called the zoe and is forty tons burden unlike most of the pleasure wherries she is not used for trading purposes during the winter months indeed all her oak fittings are permanent fixtures six or eight persons would find ample accommodation but for a lengthened cruise a party of six would be recommended this is however purely a matter of taste as the following details of her interior arrangements will show the lady's cabin is fitted with two brass bedsteads with wire spring mattresses and is furnished with a wash-hand stand water laid on writing desk plenty of drawers etc should more than two ladies be in the party there are additional mattresses to accommodate the same number which fix on the cabin floor the lavatory on board is complete with every modern yacht appliance so that the sanitary arrangements are perfect in the main hatchway a bath is fitted when required this is supplied with water from tanks on board and through a tap fixed for the purpose all waste runs into the billage the main cabin is fifteen feet long by eleven wide and has six feet headroom in this apartment particularly luxury is combined with comfort and in fact it may more properly be called the saloon the men's quarters and cooking galley are at the stern the stove i should say is easily capable of cooking for twelve and are entirely separate from the rest of the vessel although communication is rendered easy by aid of electric bells i have recently had the pleasure of inspecting this beautiful craft and her owner took particular pains to explain the various points to all of these i fear i may not have done justice but it will be gathered from what i have written that a trip on the norfolk waters in such a craft is attended with no loss of any of the comforts of life End of chapter one chapter two of notes on the broads and rivers of norfolk and suffolk by harry britton this librivox recording is in the public domain 
Norwich to Lowestoft. There's no mistake about it. I am counting on my holiday this year. This was the remark addressed to the skipper of the yacht Buttercup, at the end of a long controversy as to victualling the yacht, for certainly the twentieth time by Jack Y, one of the best-hearted fellows in the world. Of course, an individual of such a character deserves a very special introduction, although, truth to tell, he should by this time be tolerably well known to the British public, as he has nearly always been one of the crew in the skipper's published trips. I hope, therefore, my readers will dispense with the usual formalities, and as we are about to rough it together for fifteen days, make themselves as much at home on board the yacht as Jack himself. The commissariat department was complete the day before starting, with the exception of a supply of fresh meat, etc., etc., which was, of course, prepared at home, and not sent down till the last minute, and as we intended to make the most of our time, we elected to sleep on board the same night, so as to make everything snug and be ready for action the first thing next morning. I think I was the first to wake, and as on glancing at my watch I found it was six o'clock, I called John, who was out of his berth and into the river in a little less than no time. Unfortunately, I had a nasty headache and did not feel well enough to follow his example. Never mind, said Jack as he rubbed himself down. You'll soon forget all about it when we get under way. I expressed the hope that I might, and then set to work to get the breakfast things on the table, whilst our man George busied himself forward in making coffee and boiling eggs. A minute or two later, as I stood watching George down the forepeak, Jack called, Where's the mustard? Right hand up a lockers as you go into the cabin, I answered, and had forgotten both query and reply, when presently a violent interjection from my chum induced me to walk aft and see what was the matter. On looking into the cabin, I couldn't help roaring with laughter at the sight which met my eyes. Poor Johnny, in opening a tin of the before-mentioned condiment, had made a nice muddle of it, and his white flannel unmentionables were nearly covered with the yellow powder, whilst the floor was almost as bad. The mop speedily cleared up the latter, but the former were fated to retain a variegated appearance for days, much to the disgust of their wearer. During our first breakfast, we discussed the day's programme and announced to George our determination to sail to Lowestoft that day, if possible. Very sorry, sir. Can't be done with this wind, was the rather discouraging retort. We shan't lose anything by having a good try, anyway, I said and in any case I intend to be under way by eight sharp. Always supposing Braddy turns up in time, suggested John. Braddy, be it known, is the name by which one of the fixed crew of the Buttercup is called, and who had been invited to spend the day with us. It had been arranged that he should join the boat at 7.30 precisely, and, much to our surprise, before the sound of the church clock chiming the half-hour had died away, Braddy was hailing us from the opposite side of the river. Honourable commendations were liberally bestowed on him for his unusual punctuality. Our friend bowed his acknowledgments, and then disappeared inside to discuss the ham and eggs waiting his attention. Whilst he is busy in the cabin, and George making ready for a start, 
I will endeavour to tell our exact whereabouts. Reference to the map will show about a mile and a half from Norwich and near Thorpe St Andrew, two watercourses, separated by an island along which the railway runs. The one to the south, at the extreme east of which the buttercup was lying, is artificial, and was constructed by the railway company in order to keep the navigation open and unobstructed. Visitors who elect to start from Whitlingham should not omit to have a look round the capital of East Anglia, the City of Gardens. It does not come within my province to write any sort of guide to Norwich, so I must content myself with naming just a few of the lions. The chief of these are the cathedral and the castle, but St Andrew's Hall, said to be the finest Gothic hall in the kingdom, and St Peter's Church, which has recently been restored, should certainly be seen. Of course there are a number of minor attractions, but as most tourists to this part of the country come for the rivers and not the towns, I do not think it would be advisable to enlarge further on my native city. There is one suggestion I would make, however, and as this will bring me back to my favourite element, I don't think I shall be voted out of order, which is that if a day, or even half a day, can be spared, it should be spent on what is locally called the Back River. The river is so named in consequence of being behind, or above, the new mills at Norwich, beyond which it is not navigable. Boats can be hired for the purpose in Higham, and I am quite confident in saying the trip will be thoroughly enjoyed. The scenery is of a very charming character, and one stretch, called Weston's Reach, is simply lovely, for nearly its whole length it is covered by the branches of trees, and in the height of the summer is not surpassed by any similar spot in this land of rivers. I had nearly forgotten to add that Monday or Saturday should not be selected for this excursion, as on both days the followers of St Crispin, in a limited sense only, that of calling, of whom there are thousands in the city, especially affect the stream, and exhibitions of rowdyism are not infrequent. To return to my crew and the buttercup, as the clock struck eight, we were fairly under way, and congratulated ourselves on making a clean start so punctually. In the Whitlingham Reach, we were becalmed for a short time under the lee of the hills, but once clear of these, we bowled along splendidly. Passing downstream, and on the left, a picturesque cottage called the Monkey House, where a ferry formerly existed, will attract notice. A little further down is Posick Grove, a rare place for picnics, and much appreciated by the Norvik Ensians, is sure to engage attention. Just below Bramerton, famous for its crag, which the British Association journeyed to see in 1868, we overtook and passed a wherry, whose single occupant barely returned our morning salutation. As we gradually drew away, his want of civility was commented on as being contrary to what one usually receives from his class. When our lead had increased to quite half a mile, we could see something had happened, as the wherry was quite stationary. Presently, someone laughingly said, I'm blessed if the old hunks isn't on the mud, and it serves him right for being so grumpy. Yes, said George, and so are we, and it serves us right for laughing at others' misfortunes. Sure enough, we were on the putty, 
and only after a good deal of work with the norfolk yachtsman's friend the quant did we succeed in clearing ourselves a little further downstream Surlingham ferry a favourite boating and fishing station was duly noted from this point the yare fishery may be said to commence and frederick chapman of the ferry house where comfortable quarters will be found will do anything in his power to oblige strangers just below the ferry john was taken with a fishing mania and vowed he would catch a pike for dinner so he dived into the cabin for rod and line and presently started spinning unfortunately for his resolution the fish were not on the feed and at last a sadder and colder man he packed up in disgust passing brundle the winter home of the buttercup we gave messrs flowers men a salute which of course they returned we hoped to have been able to stop here but came to the conclusion it would not be wise to do so i must not however omit to say that good headquarters will be found at the yare hotel and a large supply of capital new boats of a little less clumsy type than usual Brundle railway station directly adjoins messrs flowers estate and is also the stopping place for coldham hall a famous fishing hostel about three quarters of a mile down the river i don't doubt a great many who follow in our footsteps i am afraid this sounds a little bit irish but let it pass will wonder how it is we did not stop at any of the riverside inns instead of pushing on in such a tremendous hurry for lowestoft the fact is we knew every inch of the river and the two broads which as i said in my first chapter the year drains i should have called attention to the entrances to surlingham of which there are two one above the other below brundle but on the opposite side of the river leaving coldham hall behind one fairly enters on the marsh district and for the rest of the way downstream the landscape is of a less varied character instead of pleasantly wooded slopes and groves nothing but a wide expanse of waving reed and grass meets the eye on either bank of the now stately river it would be going beyond the scope of this work to speculate what this district was like a thousand years ago when the hills far away on either side probably kept in bounds the ancient estuary garwenus but i have often pictured to myself what a magnificent sight the view from the uplands must have been as we neared buckenham ferry it became a question whether we should stop for luncheon or have it on the way but as we were bent on saving every minute we could we adopted the latter plan buckenham is the railway station for the ferry and the house will be found very central for the piscator as rockland broad where free fishing will be found is only about a mile or a mile and a half upstream very nearly three miles below buckenham langley dyke branches from the river if the visitor happens to be of an archaeological turn of mind he will do well to stop the yacht and take a row up this dyke as within a few minutes walk of its end the ruins of langley abbey will be found permission to inspect these ruins will be granted on application at the farmhouse near and i venture to predict that any one who takes the trouble to do this will be amply repaid as we passed cantley red house within about a stone's throw of the railway we noticed a number of fishing parties but in answer to our inquiries were told the fish were not biting although it is considered a good spot in cantley reach 
an annual regatta of the Norfolk and Suffolk Yacht Club is held, and its great width is sure to attract notice. No finer reach for racing can be found in all Norfolk, and as we tack through it, the buttercup passed three wherries, the men on board, which took it as a good joke, and one asked if we would give him a tow. About three miles downstream, hardly cross, at the mouth of the River Chet, marking the termination of the Norwich jurisdiction, is a very prominent landmark. Connected with Hardley Cross, a curious proclamation dating certainly as far back as Queen Elizabeth's time, and probably of even an earlier day still, is read once a year to the Corporation of Norwich, who, by the annual repetition of this form, may have preserved to themselves rights which, if it were possible, the town of Yarmouth would long ago have probably infringed, as the relative jurisdictions of the two towns here meet. The story of the struggle for supremacy on the river is a long one, and perhaps it is not well to rake up such very old grievances, but traces of the feud exist to this day, as the reports of the Port and Haven Commission meetings will amply testify. Those with a fondness for old charters, and the memories of a long-forgotten past they preserve, may like to have the words of the proclamation, which run as follows. Oye, oye, oye! If there be any manner of person that will absume, perfy, implead, or present any action, suit, plaint, or plea, for any offence, trespass, or misdemeanour, done or committed upon the Queen's Majesty's River of Wenson, let him repair unto the right worshipful Mr. Mayor, and the worshipful Sheriff of the City of Norwich, for the redress thereof, and he shall be heard. God save the Queen! The two words, absume and perfy, will probably call for comment from etymologists, and I regret I cannot throw any light on their meaning. Some years ago, and during one of the annual surveys of the river, a gentleman present asked the town clerk what he would do if any one appeared before the mayor and requested permission to absume or perfy. Tell him to do it, was the reply, and it was certainly the quickest way out of the difficulty, although history does not record if further inquiries were made. From the cross downwards, there is nothing calling for comment till Reedham Ferry, the last of the ferries on this river, is passed. As we neared Reedham Swing Railway Bridge, we were disgusted to see the red flag up, this meant stopping till a train had passed, and quite twenty minutes were lost by this delay. Getting under way again, we soon made the cut. This is an artificial channel connecting the Yare with the Waveney, and later on I shall have something to say of how and why it was constructed. It is about two and a half miles long, and is crossed at its eastern end by a lift bridge, which the keepers are always dilatory in opening. The present instance was no exception to the rule, and although we tried the expedient of shouting in chorus when about a quarter of a mile away, our vocal exertions proved unavailing. I don't think I am exaggerating when I say we were within a dozen lengths before a soul appeared, and the sides of the bridge were much nearer to my sails than I liked when we passed through. This is the only place on the rivers where any toll has to be paid, excepting the locks, and this is collected in a very curious way. What is called the nosebag is held out at the end of a long pole, 
and one of the yacht's crew has to stand ready to drop the shilling as the yacht passes. You didn't say you put eighteen pence in, did you? called one of the porters as we sailed away, and I scarcely need say he was right in his assumption. A few hundred yards from the bridge we entered on the River Waveney, and were pleased to find Herringfleet Swingbridge open. It is a curious fact that the huge structures of the Herringfleet type are worked with much greater celerity than the comparatively tiny bridge at Haddiscoe, although in both cases railway men are employed. After passing Summer Leighton, we began to see evidences of yachting, which, as we neared Alton Dyke, became more and more frequent. When we reached Alton Broad, it was quite lively with yachts of all tonnage. We ran straight across and made for the lock, and as we lay to, several yachting friends strolled down to the boat and inquired how far we had come. The passage was voted a good one, and my determination to pass through was received with surprise. How far do you intend going? asked one, the captain of the fastest open boat in these parts just into the basin so as to be ready for a long day in the open to-morrow was the reply meanwhile the buttercup had been floated into the lock and as there happened to be very little difference in the levels we were soon again under canvas we were now on salt water and lake loathing looked really fine as we scampered over its far-reaching surface Towards its eastern end, Lowestoft Inner Harbour commences, and the shipping stretches in a continuous line to the town itself. As we passed between the long stretch of vessels, we found much to interest and attract. A wherry lying alongside a big ship invited comparison. On the inland rivers, it would have seemed a veritable Goliath, but here, surrounded by sea-going craft its proportions appeared lilliputian a week or so before a large steam collier called the erasmus wilson had been run into and sunk off lowestoft but after clearing the coals out she was floated and brought into harbour the enormous hole in her side had been patched up and as the buttercup sailed by we had ample opportunity of seeing the extent of the mischief. Fortunately, the bridge connecting North and South Lowestoft was open just in time for us, and at exactly half past four we were clear of the piers and fairly out at sea. Taking into consideration that we had had contrary winds a good part of the way, I must confess I was pleased with the boat's performance, and did not forget to mention the contrary predictions of the morning. Before we start tomorrow, we must make a little alteration in the trim of the yacht, said George, as the bowsprit showed signs of dipping, although not enough to cause any inconvenience. When just below Pakefield, we went about and made for Lowestoft Harbour again, as we wished to have everything snug in good time. Shooting between the piers, we lowered our mainsail and ran under the jib alone into the inner basin, which is, during the season, entirely devoted to yachts. We had nearly reached this when John, in endeavouring to give the dinghy a longer line, and so prevent her bumping against the stern of the yacht, was severely cut in the hand. A heavy swell just at the wrong moment lifted the boat, jamming his hand between it and the yacht's taffrail, and an awful gash was the result. Honestly speaking, I think Jack was more upset at being disabled, just as his services would have been so much in requisition, than at the personal inconvenience and pain he suffered 
although this must have been very great the basin was so full of yachts of all tonnage that we had a little difficulty in finding a place but at last managed to squeeze in between a five and a fifteen mooring here is rather a more difficult process than the simple expedient of sticking two rond hooks into the banks as we do on the rivers two lines and they must be of good length are taken from the bow to dolphins on either side and for the stern the great eastern railway company provide an enormous hawser stretching the whole length of the harbour to which in a similar way lines are attached from the boat all this is much easier said than done but the result is to make the yachts all but immovable and so prevent the possibility of their chafing one against another whilst we were preparing dinner george made the discovery that we were without fresh water so he rowed to the recently erected yacht clubhouse and presently returned with an ample supply for two days although we rather chafed at the delay this occasioned we fully appreciated the excellent cup of tea which rewarded our patience the harbour that night presented a wonderful appearance as each wave broke against the massive piers a shower of phosphorescent spray illumined its crest and the glittering particles of pale blue light seemed to dance attendance in the wake this phenomenon is not by any means an unusual one but i have never seen a more brilliant exhibition of its fairy-like effects as we rowed across to the landing steps we feathered our oars and a translucent stream of light completely encircled the little craft as she shot through the water concerning lowestoft pier clement scott in one of his charming poppyland papers says it is not one of those meaningless lengthy jetties that jut out into the sea and so seriously disfigure the prospect not a stretch of boards and piles with a beginning a middle and an ending that can be indefinitely prolonged but a pier that encloses a basin a pier at whose side yachts lie at anchor and from whose steps gaily coloured young ladies start to row or sail all who know the splendid structure successive enterprises have given the town and which in the hands of the railway company has been so largely developed will agree that a more delightful promenade could hardly be desired after strolling up and down its entire length several times we accompanied braddy to the station to see him off and then returned to the yacht our friend in wishing us good-bye had predicted all sorts of consequences if we slept on board all i can say is we were fast asleep very shortly after the lights were extinguished and i can only just remember receiving a negative reply to my question is your hand any worse john when all became a blank End of chapter two chapter three of notes on the broads and rivers of norfolk and suffolk by harry Britton. this librivox recording is in the public domain digressional and otherwise don't forget george he must know the entrance to southwold harbour thoroughly an affirmative wave of the hand and a shout of all right was the only reply my last reminder received as the jolly became lost in the maze of yachts and we turned down the pier with our bathing impedimenta slung across our shoulders this ambiguous dialogue requires explanation and as we walked towards pakefield to the bathing place 
I may as well say we proposed sailing to Southwold, and as George did not know the coast so far, we decided on engaging a man who would be able to pilot us. Whilst on the whole we thoroughly enjoyed our bath, I must confess the shingle bruised, I don't think it actually cut, our feet terribly, and as we strolled back to the yacht, we made up our minds not to repeat the dose next morning. Good morning, sir. Hope you enjoyed your constitutional, were the words which greeted our return, and the speaker, whom George introduced as the man, took the painter and made fast the dinghy as we stepped on board. Well, do you know the way into Southwold? Yes, sir, but I shan't risk taking you. To my certain knowledge, three fishing boats have been shut up there for the last fortnight. This was rather a poser, as we very much reckoned on a long day outside, and I had made up my mind to look in at the little seaport as one item in the day's programme. Beg pardon? You'd better leave the dinghy behind and take my boat as well as me, suggested our new-found friend. I'll do the lot for a pound, he added confidentially. Telling, as this bait was evidently intended to be, I didn't quite fall in with the idea, although it was further supplemented by well, though roughly, drawn pictures of the ease with which we should be able to land in the larger craft. It comes to this, if we can't go ashore in our own jolly, we'll stay on the yacht, and I should like to start directly. So the question of terms, minus the boat, was settled to the satisfaction of both parties, and by nine o'clock we were under way, with two reefs down in the sails. William Stone, or Billy Hardname, as the latest addition to the Buttercup's crew facetiously called himself, proved quite an original. He had known Lowestoft all his life, and his opinion of the town somewhat resembled Peggotty's idea of Yarmouth, and if he didn't exactly say it, was, upon the whole, the finest place in the universe, his description of the Queen of Eastern Watering Places was very highly painted. Although we had reduced our sail area by nearly half, we found we had quite enough canvas, as there was rather a heavy sea on. I should have said that before starting, we shifted several hundredweight of ballast to the stern sheets of the yacht, and the alteration entirely stopped the tendency she had shown the day before to dip. As we passed by Southwold, we found it utterly impossible to get in, as the sea was breaking clean across the bar. Just inside the harbour, we could see the masts of the three imprisoned fishing boats Stone had spoken of before we started, and he didn't forget to draw our attention to this confirmation of his statement. Five miles below Southwold, the lofty tower of a ruined church stands out very prominently on the coastline. These ruins, which are all that remain of All Saints Church, are amongst the surviving evidences of the greatness of Dunwich, anciently the capital of East Anglia, and we determined on making a closer inspection. The yacht was shot into the wind, and beyond slightly drifting with the tide, became stationary, so Jack and I embarked in the little dinghy and made for the shore. Landing was not by any means so difficult and dangerous a proceeding as Billy Hardname had predicted, and we were scarcely splashed when, after hauling the boat out of reach of the breakers, we started along the path which leads up the steep sides of the lofty cliff. When we reached the summit, we turned to look at the buttercup, 
which appeared very small as she stood away from land presently george who was standing on the stern sheets of the yacht became very excited and pointed to the beach at our feet looking down we saw but here my powers of description fall short and i confess myself at a loss to put into words the sight which met our eyes readers of ancient mythology may possibly remember the two or were there three damsels of the island of caprea in the mediterranean whose wonderful powers of vocalization were so entrancing that any who sailed by became overcome by ecstasy and died well the three dunnage sirens who were disporting in sole bay were not quite so fascinating and we did not gently expire in the orthodox way to slow music but all the same we were temporarily allured by the enchantment of the view to which mayhap distance lent a helping hand tearing ourselves with difficulty from the sight of so much loveliness we turned to the more sombre relics of a bygone day as i have said before the church which crowns the brow of the cliff is or rather was dedicated to all saints the square tower is in a very fair state of preservation but of the nave of the church nothing remains but the bare walls we were much surprised to see the comparatively recent dates on some of the tombstones indicating that the churchyard had been used as a place of interment for many years subsequent to the ultimate disuse of the sacred edifice towards the end of the fifties of the last century according to lewis's topographical dictionary of england dunwich anciently contained more than fifty religious foundations including churches chapels priories and hospitals but successive encroachments of the ocean have reduced the former seat of a bishop's see to a village of two hundred and fifty inhabitants within a hundred yards or so of the edge of the cliff a wall encloses a large field and in the centre of this carefully guarded by an iron palisading there are some small portions of a ruin of course we scaled the wall in order to have a closer look and on the western side of the enclosure we found a gateway evidently of monastic origin looking on to a road this is all very nice said john but if we don't soon make a start we shan't reach lowestoft by nightfall regaining the cliffs we took a last look and then commenced the descent to the beach where with the help of one of the lifeboatmen we made a clean start in the dinghy as for a considerable portion of the way back we should have to contend with a headwind we decided it would be best not to run any further south so we commenced the return trip at once of southwold we again left the yacht for a small inland excursion after strolling about the town for half an hour or so it suddenly occurred to me we ought to see the river inquiries of a woman we met elicited the astounding assertion we ain't got no river here after that i vote we make tracks for the buttercup said john independent of having only a short time before past the channel which finds access to the sea between walberswick pronounced walserwig and southwold i was previously under the impression it was the mouth of the river blythe and i have since confirmed this wondering what in the world the native could have meant by her profession of ignorance we hastened down to the beach the old adage that too many cooks spoil the broth 
was never better instanced than in our embarkation in the dinghy at least half a dozen south waldians rushed to lend a hand and no amount of rebuffs would induce them to desist when we were quite ready to make a start the foremost of these gave the dinghy a push just at the wrong moment and a wave almost swamped us john and i being drenched nearly to our waists the victoria steamer which runs on certain days from lowestoft was lying about a quarter of a mile from shore and just abreast of this we came up with lt four nine seven the weatherly capabilities of the buttercup compared with the smack were very quickly demonstrated as we drew away from her on every tack so much so in fact that we soon forgot the circumstance many who read the narrative of our trip will probably ask what dunwich and southwold have to do with the broads and rivers of norfolk and suffolk and suggest that i have taken a wide departure from the subject indicated by my title so far as dunwich is concerned i admit this is correct but for the information of explorers of the waterways in the sister counties i ought to say that about two and a half miles as the crow flies north of southwold there is a large pool of about seventy acres in extent called eastern water and in connection with this a smaller lake named cove hythe broad about a mile and a quarter from the last named another lake designated ben acre broad will be found which abounds in freshwater fish and covers over fifty acres all these waters are very near the beach and supposing the tourist has sailed so far in the yacht an excursion could be made in the dinghy which if a light one might be easily carried over the intervening sands and launched again i wish however to add that i am not in a position to say these broads are public but i do not suppose for a moment the riparian owners one of whom is an enthusiastic yachtsman would object to any one taking a quiet row on them i hope some time in the coming summer to run down in the buttercup and just for the novelty of the thing explore these outlying items from the general district unfortunately we could not spare time on the present occasion besides which the sea was a great deal too rough for it to be safe to make the attempt but on stone's advice i climbed about halfway up the mast where i had a capital view of the first named lake whether it was caused by the yacht pitching i don't know but somehow my foot caught in one of the hoops and when i wished to descend i could not extricate it seeing the difficulty george came to my assistance and managed to free me although it was at the cost of an awful pinch whilst mays was waiting to give me a leg down his cap went overboard and notwithstanding that we offered to buy him a new one when we got into lowestoft he insisted on going about for it the chase was neither a very long nor stern one but we lost quite twenty minutes by this delay and when we recovered the vagrant headgear it was so saturated and beaten about as to be almost past recognition we had now a strong tide running with us but this meeting the wind a very heavy sea resulted when off cove hythe ness we caught the full force of this and for a time i must confess i felt a little bit nervous as i had never been out in the buttercup with anything like such a sea running this soon wore off as i found to my great delight 
that my little boat took it beautifully, riding over the waves as light as a cork. Sometimes we were in a complete trough, and it seemed almost impossible for the yacht to clear herself, but in every case she rose superior to the contending elements, shaking herself free almost like a thing of life. Shan't we swing into the harbour, by Jove? Very sorry to disappoint you, said Stone, as we went on to the port tack. I'm afraid we shall lose a lot of wind under Lowestoft Ness. Smiling incredulously, Jack eased off the jib sheet as the water came rushing along the plankways, and I shared with him in expressing our belief that it must be impossible. Those who live longest will see most, sententiously retorted the old salt, and, to pay us for having dared to dissent from his opinion, henceforward he only deigned to reply in monosyllabic grunts. Passing Kessingland, the weather showed no signs of abating, and just to worry Stone, we commenced talking at him, and presently one of us asked where the calm would come in. You'll see, you'll see, said he of the hard name, and to our very great surprise, when we beat past Pakefield, the sea was not nearly so rough. Even then, we could scarcely have believed the entrance to Lowestoft would be so utterly becalmed as it ultimately proved to be. As we drew nearer and nearer on every tack to the piers, it became evident it would be a close thing between the buttercup and a Scotch fishing boat that was approaching from the north as to which should enter first. To our great disgust, when we were within fifty yards of the harbour, the Scotch boat got out some enormous sweeps, and, thus propelled, easily got the start of us. This move on their part was fraught with a greater loss of time to us than on first examination of the relative positions of the craft would have appeared possible. It happened in this way. We were on the starboard tack, but had we kept on our course, to which we had the right, we should, as it proved, simply have run into the fishing boat amidships, and have done her a great deal more damage than she could possibly have done us. We ought, perhaps, to have remembered the adage which declares that business should have precedence of pleasure, but it was not in the best mood that we at last gave way. Strange to say, when for the second time we made for the harbour, nearly every breath of wind seemed to have fallen away, and the strong ebb tide then running out almost held us stationary. At last we drew slowly in, and by six o'clock had made all square and snug for the night. Since we had turned out in the morning, one of our next-door neighbours, the Dorothy, of the Royal Harwich Yacht Club, had left, and her place was occupied by the Firebrand, one of the beautiful new schooner bell cutters of the Norfolk and Suffolk Yacht Club. Perhaps I am a little bit keen on schooner bells, as my own yacht is so built, but I do think the form which her famous namesake introduced is infinitely prettier than the ordinary cutter stem. During dinner, our sailing master of the day gradually threw aside the, perhaps, natural ire he had shown at our stupid banter. Probably the fact that his prediction had been so literally fulfilled helped the thawing process, but I am inclined to believe, notwithstanding his assertions to the contrary, that some very heavy-looking storm clouds had more to do with the sudden calm than the ness. In the evening, we went for another walk round the interesting town, and on returning to the pier, found a capital band playing. 
the stand on which the musicians were performing faces the yachting harbour and as there was a great crowd in its immediate vicinity we returned to the buttercup where we could hear beautifully the better to enjoy the pleasure of listening to the lively strains i brought on deck a patent folding chair which belongs to the boat and which enables one to sit at any angle arranging this so low as to be more like a hammock than anything else i lay at my ease perfectly content with my surroundings gradually the music became less and less distinct and i was very nearly in dreamland when john who had been reading a book in the cabin roused me by calling now then skipper don't you think you'd better come inside and start on your notebook but i bothered the notes and didn't take his excellent advice until the band ceased playing at nine o'clock at the moment of writing this i have before me the rough diary of our cruise and the second day's entries are so indistinct that i must have been very nearly asleep before i finished as a specimen of what it is like i give the last four lines dinner over stroll on pier then round town and afterwards pier again band playing back to yacht where we could hear lovely music so entrancing john soon became sleepy turned in at ten end of chapter three chapter four of notes on the broads and rivers of norfolk and suffolk by harry Britton. this librivox recording is in the public domain lowestoft to beckles when george put his head into the cabin next morning and called us it was later than it should have been and he excused himself by saying it didn't matter as we shouldn't be able to move this sounded badly so we hurried on our things and went on deck to judge for ourselves there was no mistake about it it did look like a dirty day and the wind whistled through the rigging with an ominous moan foreboding gusty weather although we had the previous day decided not to bathe again on the beach we made up our minds to chance it but were more severely punished than on our first attempt while sitting at breakfast we heard a sort of cough evidently intended to attract attention so i went outside and there holding on to the stern of the yacht was the courteous harbour master who had come to tell us that all yachts must be clear away by the twenty-eighth instant i suppose that most of my readers are aware that lowestoft harbour and the cutting through to lake loathing are quite artificial perhaps however a sketch of the history of the movement which ended in the now prosperous town becoming a port may be deemed interesting i have elsewhere promised to enter more thoroughly into this question and at some future time i intend to redeem the pledge for the present i doubt the material i have been enabled to collect is only a drop in the ocean compared with the largeness of the subject but as rome was not built in a day i do not despair of the ultimate realization of my more ambitious project i ought to say in starting that to the mercenary spirit of yarmouth in the early part of this century the very existence of lowestoft as a port can be traced it came about in this way all goods consigned by ship to norwich merchants were discharged into wherries and thus conveyed up the river to the city the bother this plan entailed 
leaving out of the question the largely increased expense of transit, brought about an agitation which culminated in Alderman Crisp Brown submitting to the corporation, on the 3rd of May 1814, a plan for making Norwich a port by way of Yarmouth. Four years later, the engineer's report was published, but, without detailing any particulars, I will say the town of Yarmouth simply declined to allow the proposed cut on the south side of Braden, through which it was intended vessels should be conveyed, to be made. Nothing daunted by opposition to scheme number one, the promoters had a second report prepared by their engineer, William Cubitt, which appeared in July 1820. On page three of that report, the following passage occurs. The most eligible line appears to be, in going from Norwich, to leave the Yare at Reedham, and, by a new cut or canal of communication of about two miles and a half long, to join the River Waveney a little above St. Olive's Bridge. Proceeding along the Waveney to Alton Dyke, and through that into Lake Lothing, from which a cut of less than 500 yards would be in deep water of the sea. If I add to this that at the spot where Mutford Bridge divided Alton Broad from Lake Lothing, it was proposed to construct a lock, so that the salt water could never extend beyond the causeway at Mutford, the whole scheme is roughly laid out. Following the publication of the plan for constructing the New Haven, as it was called at the time, a prolix discussion in the public press, and by the issue of pamphlets broadcast, commenced. Read now, some of the latter seem ridiculous, and in particular, I have been much amused by the way in which the warning voice was only issued to call for a reply by the voice of truth, and vice versa. The bill passed both Houses of Parliament and received the Royal Assent on May the 28th, 1827, although the year before it had been lost by a majority of five. Those engaged in the prosecution of the measure must have had a merry time of it, as it seems that something like £25,000 was expended. Yarmouth paid for its whistle to the tune of £8,000. The navigation was opened on the 10th of August, 1831, but eleven years later the original proprietors were glad to sell their venture at a very heavy sacrifice to a new company, who in turn disposed of it to Sir Morton Pito in 1844. I have now in my possession a document containing a complete list of the second company of proprietors, and to which is attached all their autographs excepting three. The old paper is to me very interesting, as showing the end of the second act in the history of Lowestoft as a 19th century port. After all, Lowestoft gained a great deal more than Norwich by the measure. Perhaps the old city is too far inland, although I must confess I can never quite understand why, with the undoubted advantage of being situated on a navigable river of the dimensions of the Wensum, more use is not made of the water as a means of communication. I am afraid I shall be thought to have forgotten all about the buttercup during this somewhat lengthy digression. So, with apologies to John, I will return to my narrative. By starting now, you'll do the trick, said one of the men on board an adjoining yacht. Look, the flag is now coming down. So we cast off our moorings and tacked into the outer harbour. 
and then ran up the river like opening to the bridge the keepers were such an awful time opening it that we decided we must go about just at the last moment however one of the men yelled come on we yachting men in norfolk get somewhat used to close shaves with bridges but in my experience i have never cut it so fine as on that morning at lowestoft our position was rendered more awkward by a tug coming up just behind with a large vessel in tow but all's well that ends well we sailed on to within a hundred yards of colton colville railway bridge which crosses the lake within a short distance of alton and then lowered our mainsail the rest of the way we sailed with jib alone but on arriving at the lock we were delayed by a most idiotic wherryman as a general rule these men are uncommonly handy about their craft but this must have been one of the exceptions which go to prove it there was a boy on board who was the coolest young rascal i ever saw and the way in which he mouthed and swore at his mate was something remarkable eventually to save time we entered the lock behind the wherry and were treated to a further exhibition from the junior on board once clear of our disagreeable neighbours we lost no time in again hoisting sail and whilst they were thinking about a start we were half across the broad i think it would be very unfair of me not to say something of the attractions of alton before leaving our hurried run across both in going and coming might otherwise be taken as indicating that the place has no particular claim on one's attention the fact is it is the most popular of all the broads and at all times during the season is made gay with the yachts of various tonnage that dot its surface in addition to its advantages as a yachting station in being so near railway sea and river there are few better fishing grounds as is amply proved by the grand collection of stuffed specimens in the museum of the wherry hotel which overlooks the broad this inn is the best in the place although anglers will find good accommodation at the commodore alton has not only the advantage of being within a few minutes railway ride of lowestoft but is also only a sixteen minutes journey from st olives where omnibuses by arrangement take visitors to fritton lake we enjoyed our run over the broad to the full and half wished we had a longer time to stay but we intended to save the tide up to beckles on reaching the end of the dyke we found a wherry hard and fast on the mud so we ran the buttercup up nearly alongside and asked if we could be of any assistance thank you kindly we should be glad of the dinghy was the response it seemed that they had in coming round the very sharp bend from river to dyke omitted to ease off the sheet until too late and had run ashore with terrific force that we should have a tough job to move her was soon proved as the five of us standing with our shoulders under the bows did not appear to stir her an inch as this plan failed we took a heavy anchor belonging to the wherry to the opposite side of the dyke to this was attached a thick cable coming from their windlass and after nearly burying the anchor we gave the signal for them to go ahead the line gradually tightened and at last became so taut that blondin would have walked across it easily presently the anchor moved and although both john and i stood on it it was gradually pulled through the yielding soil it travelled in this way several yards 
leaving a furrow about three inches wide by nine deep. Finding it was no use continuing the attempts without further aid, we shouted for them to stop. Our next expedient consisted in forcing a very thick mop stick through the ring of the anchor. On resuming operations, this snapped in halves directly the strain was applied, and as several wherries were roaring down on us, we gave up all efforts to heave her off by means of the windlass. I must confess to a feeling of surprise that none of the passing wherries stopped to help their fellows in misfortune, but although six came by whilst we were on board, not one so much as offered to lend a helping hand. We were now in the position of not knowing what to do next, and we stood looking at the wherrymen in the most helpless way. They, poor fellows, were the pictures of misery, and beyond a faintly expressed hope that they might be able to get their craft off on the top of the tide, appeared to have given up all immediate idea of doing so. It will be hardly necessary for me to say that from the moment it was high tide at the spot where we were then lying, the water would commence to ebb, and if we waited so long, we should have it against us the whole way to our intended destination. To do the wherryman credit, I ought to say that they first suggested we must not delay much longer, and whilst thanking us in the most effusive way for the services we had endeavoured to render, they simply insisted on our making a start. Why should you lose your tide for us? asked one. But, somehow, we hardly liked to leave them in their trouble, and it was very reluctantly that we at last got under way again. Before doing this, we offered the men a glass of beer, and I scarcely need say they accepted it. The waterman who would say no to such an invite is a rarity very seldom met with. The toast they proposed was almost amusing. It ran something like this. We don't know your names, gentlemen, but here's to the buttercup for ever. Just ahead of us, as we left the dike, was a large sea yacht of about 25 tons, and although at first we thought we should pass her, she managed to keep the lead. One of the most striking objects on the Waveney is the very peculiar church steeple of Borough St Peter. It is more like a series of very high steps than anything else I know of, and the edifice itself is worthy a visit. On a former occasion, the rector had invited us to inspect the old pile, which I remember was then beautifully decorated with flowers, so we did not stay to look over it again. Shall we give old Bob a call? said John, as we passed through Oldby Swing Railway Bridge, which, fortunately, was open. Bob, I should say, was a colleague of ours, whose home at Oldby Hall overlooks the bridge, and who was taking his holiday at the same time. Stupid as it may seem, we shouted at the top of our voices, but of course received no reply, and, indeed, our friend has since informed me that at the time we were passing he was quite three miles away. Without any incident demanding attention, we reached Beckles and moored in a dyke running at right angles with the bridge. Soon after, two yachts came into the same cutting, one stopping above, the other below the buttercup. When we had tidied up, George started on an expedition in search of vegetables, but, to our great surprise, returned almost immediately. We were about asking what this meant, when the intended question was rendered unnecessary by an old man with a cart coming round the corner 
and making straight for the boat shouting the while from sheer force of habit i suppose some of the most unintelligible cry the old costermonger pulled up alongside upon the selection offered we made rather a liberal onslaught so much so in fact that the well in which the various edibles were stowed temporarily looked something like a small greengrocer's shop our purchases complete jack and i went for a look round the town which is remarkably clean and well built beckles is a town unusually favoured as its lucky residents are never troubled by that bane of existence the local rate collector the expenses attending the lighting cleaning etc of the borough being defrayed by the rents accruing from certain town lands so that persons of a limited income would find this a most desirable place to live in the church dedicated to st michael is a very fine gothic structure the tower which rises to a height of ninety-five feet and then stops short in an evidently unfinished state stands at some little distance from the southeast angle of the chancel seen from the river which runs far away down in the valley beneath the church presents a really imposing appearance and is calculated to impress the most indifferent observer after indulging in the luxury of a clean shave a process which was very conducive to my comfort we made for the yacht where at six o'clock to the minute as we had arranged dinner was on the table the evening which followed was spent in a very quiet manner and the town was declared to be an awfully dull place by gaslight End of chapter 4chapter five of notes on the broads and rivers of norfolk and suffolk by harry britton this librivox recording is in the public domain beckles to st olives never once in the yachting season of eighty six had we awakened to a lovelier day than on the morning following our arrival at beckles turning over in my berth at about half past six i pulled back one of the cabin blinds and a stream of sunlight poured in its powerful influence soon dispelled any inclination i might have had for another nap so calling george we dressed and went on deck on one of the adjoining yachts the men were busy scrubbing their decks this example was soon followed by george in fact we all three went to work and a fine appetizer the exercise proved revelling in the feeling of perfect contentment which a knowledge that his craft is in perfect order throughout always affords a practical yachtsman we lounged about till nearly eleven when at last we got under way the wind was blowing very hard and we found quite enough to do although we had taken one reef down in the sails unfortunately the wind was in the wrong quarter for us so we had a very long spell of tacking within a mile of beckles sayers grove slopes down to the riverside and although i have never landed i should say the view from the top of the hills must be a very pretty one seen from the river i always think this spot resembles posset grove which it will be remembered we passed on our first morning although of course the latter is much more extensive what in the world was that pitching about in the peak asked george when after turning through a long reach we were running free i'll see volunteered john but instead of walking forward and lifting the hatch 
he dived inside the cabin and lay along the seats with his head into the forepeak of course he could scarcely see but presently thinking he had discovered the particular item of the buttercup stores which had been making the noise he put his arm through the hatchway to reach it unluckily for jack at the same moment we caught a puff and the boat careened so much that he shot off the seat under the cabin table with cushions and everything on top of him i scarcely need say george and i were simply convulsed at poor jack's endeavours to free himself it may seem to have been rather hard on my friend but mischief has a proverbial effect on one's risible faculties and after all jack didn't mind reaching the spot where we left the wherry on the mud the day before we found she had disappeared but a large angular cutting into the rond bore evidence of the distance she must have been embedded looking down alton dyke we could see the trixie one of the norfolk flyers making in the same direction as ourselves and after about a quarter of an hour she came up with and passed us in the summer Leighton bridge reach we had not only a head wind to contend with but the full force of a strong flood tide tack after tack we made without appearing to gain headway and sometimes we even lost ground at last by very smart handling of the boat we drew to the bridge and just at the right moment one of the keepers threw us a line with this help we managed to accomplish our object and as the river takes a turn a little beyond where the railway crosses our difficulties were over sailing till we came to the junction of the cut we continued our course down the river to st olive's bridge a handsome structure of the suspension type leaving our man to lower the mast and prepare dinner we started walking to fritton lake which lies about a mile and a half from the river i advise any who may come to the broad district to allow one day for the exploration of fritton and its vicinity to start with the walk lies through a very pretty country and if the tourist takes the turn to the left just on the river side of st olive's railway crossing a minute's walk will bring him to the ruins of herringfleet priory at the farm near excellent milk cream etc can be obtained and permission to inspect the ruins will also be readily granted the priory had a triple dedication first to st olive and then to the virgin mary and st edmund but the remains are now very small about a century ago the old boundary walls were used in repairing a road but those who are fond of relics of a bygone day will find enough to furnish hours of speculative thought we did not on this occasion stay for the priory but pushed on for the lake we were caught halfway in a shower of rain and sheltered ourselves under a fence this did not form a very complete cover and it looked very much as though we were in for a wetting when fortunately the rain ceased continuing our walk we passed fritton church which is nicely situated the tower is a round one and the fabric is thatched but with the growth of trees in the background it makes a picture of a pretty country church fritton old hall is the station where boats are let for fishing etc and one cannot help wondering how it is such a fine old house has been degraded to its present condition i understood some alterations were intended to be made and have endeavoured to learn particulars but to no purpose 
not being in a position to say positively whether the reported improvements will really be carried out i am bound to speak of the place as i found it and my advice to any proposing to stay here will be summed up in the one word don't of the lake itself i would say that to gild refined gold to paint the lily is not a more unnecessary process than any attempt to describe its varying beauties in my enthusiasm for the broads i was told five or six years ago i should soon tire of their attractions but it hasn't happened yet i sometimes find a difficulty in restraining myself in the use of descriptive language all i can say of fritton is that every one of the adjectives in my vocabulary would not overpaint it after selecting our boat we were about starting when suddenly jack exclaimed i'm blessed if john c isn't in the boat making this way on nearer approach this was verified and in another half minute a mutual friend of ours who had it seemed been fishing all day landed expressions of surprise at our chance meeting having been exchanged we made inquiries as to the catch and presently a very fair number of roach and bream were shot onto the grass some of the specimens were of respectable dimensions and all looked really beautiful in their absolute freshness as they lay on the green sward unfortunately our friend was in a hurry to catch the next train and all our endeavours to persuade him to stay and spend the evening with us were of no avail promising to return to the buttercup if he missed the train and wishing us good-bye he made off in a great hurry wicked as it may seem we both hoped he might not succeed in his object and as we left the shore we expressed our feelings in words which it would not have been well for our departing colleague to hear rowing across the lake which i may say is three miles long we made for one of the decoy pipes duck decoying is still carried on at five different points in norfolk but the fritton decoys of which there are two sets are by far the most important the process is of course familiar to most of my readers but to make my sketch complete i ought perhaps to give a short description of the way in which wild fowl are enticed into these ingenious traps what is technically called the pipe is really a curving ditch covered in by netting stretched across an archway of hoops these hoops which at the mouth of the dyke are about ten feet high gradually diminish in size until they become so low that one cannot sit upright in a boat at the extreme end a purse net is fixed and the unlucky duck that once gets so far has very very little chance of beating a retreat on one side of this avenue of netting a series of reed fences is so arranged that the man engaged in decoying cannot be seen from the outside although he has the advantage of an unobstructed view up the pipe by means of small peepholes in the first and second screens he can also see the unsuspecting wildfowl in the lake beyond who are possibly fraternizing with trained members of their kind the latter act as their betrayers by alluring them to the mouth of the fatal trap we will suppose the decoy man has discovered a sufficient number of ducks to make it worth his while to attempt to entrap them the first step in the process consists in sending round the front screen a dog 
which is trained to return immediately to its master by way of the dog jump the effect of the repetition of this simple expedient round two or three screens in succession is to arouse the curiosity of the ducks which scramble forward in order to get a nearer view of the strange animal when by this means the keeper thinks they are high enough up he shows himself and the affrighted birds rush forward into the purse net perhaps all this sounds very simple but greater art than appears on first sight is necessary to make a successful coy man mr southwell says with decoys the art of fowling reached the acme of perfection for although all methods of wild fowling depend in a more or less degree for their success upon the skill and ingenuity of the fowler added to a thorough knowledge of the haunts and habits of the quarry still if numbers be taken as the standard of success all the earlier modes of taking fowl are as far inferior to the decoy as the crossbow to the fowling piece of to-day i must confess i have very little respect for the whole business and although an exact knowledge of the habits of wild fowl may be absolutely essential to make a successful decoy man i cannot think the process is sportsmanlike i may add however that mr southwell endorses the opinion of lubbock and i advise any one who may care to pursue the subject to get the fauna of norfolk where at page one hundred and thirty four and again in the appendix a quantity of information on this subject will be found the particular pipe which jack and i inspected is beautifully situated and its whole appearance is calculated to easily deceive the wild fowl when we landed after a most enjoyable trip the old man who took charge of the boat was interviewed in an article which had appeared a few months before in the english illustrated magazine a lengthy description of the gentle old boatkeeper had appeared we asked him if he knew he had been written about in a london periodical and with a look of real pleasure he answered in the affirmative they say you have lived here for more than half a century is this the case yes sir fifty-five year and more they say too you are not tired of your beautiful lake oh no oh no would you really if you had your life to live over again still stay here i couldn't leave it if i tried and he glanced across the broad with a look of infinite pride in his gentle eyes our chat over we wished him good-bye and wandered through the woods which run quite down to the water's edge presently we came to a spot which seemed very familiar and i remembered it was the subject of a large photo of frith's in my album at home we had not walked far when we saw a notice nailed to a tree which ran as follows all persons that picnic in this wood are requested to go to the house and pay tuppence each before partaking of their meal or they will be requested to leave the grounds by order it seemed a strange way to make the charge we thought but investors to the extent named certainly get value for their money as a lovelier place for open-air parties could not be found on returning to the boat we learned that no visitor had called so there was no doubt our friend had caught his train after all as we were so near yarmouth which is our man's home he asked permission to run over for the night this was of course granted and after seeing him depart 
we strolled toward Haddiscoe. Near the swing bridge, a number of navvies were congregated, and one was making himself heard in a very forcible manner. I don't know if any one had attempted the process, but he was, "'Wantin' to see the man who could stand him on his head.' He repeated this invitation several times in a semi-drunken brawl, but no one accepted. Certain it is that I, for one, should not have liked to attempt to reverse his natural position. As he stood, quite six feet two or three, and was very strongly built. Near St. Olive's Bridge, on the Herringfleet side, stands a quaint-looking old inn named the Bell, and visitors to Fritton Lake would do well to make a note of the fact, as nothing stronger than soda water or lemonade can be obtained at the old hall. Although externally it looks like one of the old-fashioned sort of country inns, the inside does not quite sustain the impression. A visit to this antiquated house, which, I must confess, was disappointing, terminated our day's programme, and we returned to our home on the water, feeling rather sold. As Johnny very sagely remarked afterwards, when he was enjoying his last pipe, it is never wise to judge by outside appearances. End of chapter 5Chapter 6 of Notes on the Broads and Rivers of Norfolk and Suffolk by Harry Britton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. St. Olives to Yarmouth and Acle. As it had been arranged that George should return by the first train, so as to allow of our starting with the ebb tide, Jack and I turned out of our berths early and made everything ready for sailing. There was so little wind blowing that we shook out the reefs of the sails, and by the time our man put in an appearance, all we had to do was cast off. For about the first mile or two, we drew along very quietly, and then, to our great surprise, the wind increased in such a sudden manner that it became a question if it would not be best to reef again. However, we kept on, and the excitement was simply delightful. We were nearing the end of a long reach, through which we had to tack, when we heard a thud in the forepeak. "'What can it be?' asked George. "'I thought I left everything square. "'Wait till we get on the next tack, and then I'll see what's amiss.' said Jack. Before the next tack came, however, the secret was out, as we heard a terrific crash, and our olfactory nerves were assailed by a strong spiritous smell. It happened that we had bought the morning before a gallon of methylated spirit, and this was sent down to the boat in an earthen bottle. The unwisdom of this was now proved, and I didn't forget to take George to task for not having packed it more carefully. Never mind, said Jack. It will make another item for the diary. It's all very well to talk of items, I replied. My book must have an enormous sale to justify an outlay of four shillings and sixpence per incident. After this casualty, we decided to tempt the fates no longer, so we lay to and again reefed our sails. That this was quite necessary was abundantly proved when a little later we reached the most risky of all Norfolk waters, Borough Flats. We had hoped to be able to land and inspect the famous ruins of Borough, but by the time we passed the old castle, the wind was blowing half a gale, so we decided to keep on for Yarmouth. Circumstances permitting, 
I strongly advise stopping at Borough, as the ruins are very extensive. Some idea of this will be gained when I say they enclose a space of five acres. Although more than 18 centuries have elapsed since the castle was built, some of the walls, which are three yards through, yet rise to a height of 14 feet. In leaving the Waveney, I ought, perhaps, to say that it is not by any means usual to take the course we did. The general plan is to sail through the cut to Reedham, and then follow the river Yare. By this means, the bother of lowering the mast is saved, and although it is about a mile and a half further, I advise the adoption of the more customary route. In point of fact, my only reason for sailing down the Waveney from St. Olive's was because it happened to be the one stretch of Norfolk River I had not previously navigated. As I had already intimated, the Beckles River, as it is technically styled, empties through Borough Flats, and opening from the latter is the glorious expanse of Braden Water. This tidal lake is about five miles long by a mile broad, and a sail over its surface with a strong wind is a treat not soon forgotten. Perhaps in the present instance we had a little too much for comfort, as every now and again the water came rushing over the sides like a mill race. The lanyards of the main shrouds cut the water into a fine spray, and on the port side of the yacht a perfect shower poured along the plankways and into the well. When about halfway across, we met the city of Norwich, a large screw passenger steamer, and the people on board crowded to the side as we passed. The wind as we neared Yarmouth appeared to increase, and personally I felt much relieved when George cleverly shot the buttercup alongside another yacht lying by lake and stores. By this time it was past ten o'clock, and as we had started without breakfast, we were as hungry as hunters. Directly we could get away, Jack and I started to the post office for letters. As the tide would be two or three hours before it made up the North River, as the Bure is generally called, we continued our walk through Regent Street to the marketplace and made several purchases. The town of Great Yarmouth, as is generally known, is a great centre of the fishing industry. In a list published in the first part of the new journal of the National Fish Culture Association, I learn that Yarmouth sent by railway in the year 1885 29,658 tonnes of fish. This grand total is the largest published except in Grimsby, and the neighbouring town of Lowestoft stands third, with 24,799 tonnes. In the autumn of last year, the catch of herrings alone by Yarmouth boats reached the enormous total of 240,000 barrels. Whilst the fishing of Yarmouth is on the increase, the general trade of the port is decidedly retrograde, and customs dues have fallen from sixty nine thousand seven hundred and twenty six pounds in eighteen forty one to thirty one thousand one hundred and ten pounds in eighteen eighty one. Visitors to the place cannot fail to be struck by the peculiar system of narrow lanes called rows, which are certainly the feature of the town. There are 156 of these alleys, and their total length is about 8 miles. Some of them are so narrow that two people would find a difficulty in passing each other 
without a certain amount of dodging that this is literally a fact will be more easily credited when i add that one of the rows does not exceed two feet three inches in width the average breadth of the entire system is about two yards and one cannot help wondering what the early builders of the town had in view in economizing space to such a remarkable degree there are of course several conjectures but the one most probable is that in the old time the fisher folk in spreading out their nets to dry left a clear space of three to six feet between in time these passages became so sharply defined that they were perpetuated in their present curious form so says one theory and i give it for what it is worth but yarmouth can in any case claim to possess what is probably the narrowest system of streets in the world amongst the buildings in the town worthy of a visit the fine old church appropriately dedicated to the fisherman's patron st nicholas stands first and foremost it is the largest parish church in england and exceeds in dimensions several of the cathedrals it was founded by herbert de la Signa, bishop of norwich about twenty-seven years after the same prelate had laid the foundation stone of his cathedral much as i should like to give a lengthened description of this magnificent church i fear it would be going beyond the scope of this work to do so so i will hurry on to another attraction the old toll house which stands at the end of row 108 in middlegate street this old building was for centuries used as a prison and has been recently converted to the uses of a free library it must not be missed as it is one of the features of this quaint old town the municipal buildings on the hall quay are very fine the original cost of this pile was forty thousand pounds but a large additional sum is about to be spent to ensure its safety as unfortunately the foundations proved to be insecure besides the three buildings i have mentioned yarmouth does not possess many lions although the nelson column on the south deans is worthy of notice it rises to a height of one hundred and forty four feet and is a very prominent landmark after all the sands are the town's crowning glory and if one does not object to seeing a certain amount of rough horseplay a stroll along its far-reaching extent will certainly amuse i am afraid i cannot speak for edifying results however mr walter rye in his history of norfolk says without any exception yarmouth is the beastliest hole any boating man can have to stay at the bowling green is the best mooring place but bad is the best and if by luck one can in coming from the norwich river to the north river or vice versa catch the tide one should certainly do so and not wait a night here i entirely agree with this and advise any who may wish to see the town and it is really well worth seeing to run over by rail from some station on the rivers for this purpose Reedham, alton st olives Acle, or potterhyam would be equally suitable it had been arranged when we left the buttercup that she should be taken into the north end as the mouth of the bure is called to our surprise when we returned we found the yacht had only just been quanted through the two bridges 
and that everything was in the confusion which always follows lowering the mast now we were expecting a visitor by the next train and i had particularly wished to have the boat in order by the time he arrived so i inquired of george what had caused the delay very sorry sir we couldn't possibly get through afore the tide has only just turned was the answer have you been to the station for the hampers no sir hadn't had the time you mean to say but the finish of the sentence was stopped by jack suggesting that we should make a run for the station which was a very little distance away whilst george tidied up as well as he could to our disgust there was not a soul to be seen when we arrived on the platform and the parcels office was locked presently a solitary porter dawned on the scene and our impatient inquiries as to where the clerks had stowed themselves were answered by a cool rejoinder of gone to dinner a little persuasion made all the more eloquent by well never mind what induced the solitary representative of the great eastern railway company to go for the key a minute or so later a junior clerk turned up and after we had signed for our packages he offered to send them to the yacht our answer was simply to shoulder a hamper apiece and before he had time to recover from his surprise we were out of the station the contents of the baskets were hastily transferred to the lockers and i managed to get back to the station just as the train ran in well Britain, what sort of a time have you had and how are you were the inquiries with which the latest addition to the buttercup's crew greeted me cab sir cab sir and whilst i was thinking about replying to our friend a cabby had seized his portmanteau and other impedimenta and made off with them as we drove to the boat which only took us about two minutes i gave a rough outline of our proceedings up to our arrival at yarmouth and sketched our proposed movements for the next day or two how far shall we get to-night to acle bridge twelve miles upstream i hope it won't be all like this was the remark when we arrived at our mooring place no indeed i ought to tell you this is really the worst spot in norfolk for boating men and to emphasize my express dislike for our surroundings i quoted the passage from mr rye already given perhaps we are somewhat rough on yarmouth in respect to its position but after all there is little doubt that the town reaps very real advantages from being situated at the mouth of a river like the yare with its added volume of six navigable tributaries the buttercup was lying outside a wherry and as we swarmed over this our visitor remarked on the yacht's long rakish appearance which the schooner bow of course helps within twenty yards of where we were then lying a most deplorable accident happened on the second of may eighteen forty five on which date a circus clown had been advertised to take an aquatic trip in a tub drawn by geese a number of people were assembled on the first suspension bridge nearly on the site of the present structure to witness the performance when through a sudden movement of the crowd the bridge gave way of the four hundred people who were thus precipitated into the water seventy-nine were drowned the day before i wrote this i was given a graphic description of the scene by one who arrived on the spot about ten minutes after the disaster 
my friend immediately sketched the harrowing picture and an engraving of his drawing was published in the illustrated london news at that time it was very nearly three before we started and we were heartily glad to shift from such very disagreeable quarters every one who has written on the broads and rivers has compared the country through which the first i suppose i should say the last seven miles or so of the river bure runs with holland as i have never been to the hollow land i suppose i ought not to express any opinion on the subject but if this particular bit of norfolk bears any resemblance to dutch scenery i must remark that it does not say much for the country which produced rembrandt van Rijn and which constituted the field for his analysis of light and shade i was reading a little time ago that in all the great painter's works whatever their special character light was his principal study and again never before rembrandt had the poetry the mysterious charm of light been revealed as it was to him and he first made of light the essence aim of painting if the comparison is intended to refer to the wonderful tricks of light and shade which here equally with holland an intimate knowledge of their various phases gives opportunity for observing i am prepared to admit its truth although under ordinary circumstances a more dreary stretch of country is scarcely conceivable rembrandt himself would have been struck with the trickery of the norfolk effects and although i cannot even sketch myself i confess to having often been carried away by our after sunset glories the passage upstream for the first three miles was unmarked by any occurrence worthy of note till we became interested in racing two wherries one we easily passed but overhauling the second proved a very difficult matter and george predicted that we should not be able to manage it several times we appeared to be making up to the craft and then she would shoot ahead whilst we are endeavouring to overtake her it may be as good a time as any to give some particulars of these barges i have already described the premier wherry yacht zoe but her trading compeers i scarcely need say are not so elaborately fitted up of wherrymen and their craft a great deal could be said but i should think more suitable craft for the navigation of rivers of the norfolk type were never devised they are worked by means of one huge sail fixed well forward and are entirely distinct from keels which carried their sails amidships in the early part of this century however both descriptions of barges were employed as is proved in the introduction to the norfolk tour published in eighteen twenty nine where it is said that the general navigation from norwich to yarmouth is performed by keels and wherries when and how the former description were last used i have been unable to ascertain but undoubtedly the retention of the latter form is really an illustration of the survival of the fittest i have sometimes wondered why craft of the norfolk wherry type could not be employed on the canal-like rivers of the fen district many a time i have watched a string of lighters on the ooze between littleport and ely and felt that the present system of horse towage might be exchanged for some more rapid method it may be urged 
that the frequent bridges would militate against the successful employment of mastered vessels all i can say in answer to this is that our wherrymen treat bridges as very trifling affairs i have often watched them when in full swing lower first the sail and then their enormous mast and shoot a bridge without losing way there is one item in a wherry's outfit which calls for special comment the quant this is a long pole of eighteen to twenty two feet long with a turned knob at the top called the bot and a toe of iron with a projecting shoulder to prevent it slipping too far into the mud in its use the men are very great adepts the bot forms the shoulder piece and by firmly fixing this just above the armpit great power is obtained having placed the quant in position with its toe resting in the bed of the river or perhaps stuck into the rond if there is sufficient depth of water to allow of the wherry coming close to the side the wherryman or yachtsman as the case may be walk slowly aft and of course the craft shoots ahead all this sounds very simple and struck by the apparent ease of the process many a novice who comes here for his holiday will probably thirst to acquire the art i ought not to damp such a one's ardour but he may rest assured that like a good many other things in this world it is not by any means so easy as it looks to leave quants and wherries in general for the wherry in particular which we were racing up the bure i have as a faithful chronicler to admit we were beaten when about seven miles from yarmouth the wind had lulled so considerably that we stopped to shake out the reefs and our rival by this means got such a long start that it became an impossibility to overtake her from this point upstream the general characteristics of the surrounding country undergo a change and the landscape becomes much more interesting instead of a boundless view of never-ending marsh which although under certain circumstances as i have said before is beautiful enough in its way scarcely possesses one redeeming feature glimpses of woodland now appear within about two miles of acle bridge the first noteworthy point is reached this is stokesby ferry inn where the first bure ferry crosses the river in the event of being unable to obtain staying quarters at acle i should say visitors might do worse than adopt this as temporary headquarters as host thirtle has the name for making travellers comfortable on reasonable terms as we slowly tack past the village which is very near to the river it looked very picturesque in the half twilight just above stokesby come herringby to give it its full name and on the same side of the river is the sluice through which a large section of the broads is drained this is called the muck fleet and possibly later on we may explore its diminutive channel it was a great deal later than we had expected when at last acle bridge loomed through the darkness and we were heartily glad to find ourselves once again within the pale of civilization the inner man of the buttercup's crew had for some time previous to our stopping been complaining and when at last dinner was on the table the pièce de résistance which consisted of roast lamb and mint sauce was attacked with a vigour which proved beyond a doubt the keenness of our appetites one incident during 
or rather as it proved nearly at the end of our meal provoked a general laugh at my expense the hampers which arrived that morning at yarmouth contained a fresh supply of good things it will be remembered that these were unpacked very hurriedly and during this process i saw john place in one of the lockers a pie i had jumped to the conclusion that this was a fruit tart so i inquired if any one cared for sweets this was generally assented to but as george handed the pie into the cabin its dimensions called for remark as being unusually large my readers will judge of my chagrin when on cutting into it it proved to be of the veal and ham persuasion a toothful of fizz would be just the thing to wash our dinners down suggested our visitor suppose we open the hamper i brought on hearing this jack coolly walked out of the cabin and returned with a bottle of champagne in each hand looking very much as though he had already acquainted himself with its contents during the evening we enjoyed a smoke and a drink and yarned over past adventures our friend contributing some experiences in the pyrenees compared with which our broad trips seemed very tame End of chapter six chapter seven of notes on the broads and rivers of norfolk and suffolk by harry britton this librivox recording is in the public domain acle to wroxham if you take my advice mr britton you'll stay in bed for another half hour as we shall be in rather a muddle for about that time right you are i'm quite willing to take the hint i feel very comfortable well within the promised thirty minutes the yacht was through the bridge and ready to proceed this spot i should say is quite a centre of departure for exploration of the best part of the district and in the season there is published every week in the yarmouth papers a long list of yachts which pass through acle bridge on the way to the broads we left our moorings at about eleven o'clock with wind and tide against us which made our passage very slow indeed it was quite one by the time we reached st benedict's abbey a famous old ruin of which more anon where we lay to for luncheon the veal and ham pie aforesaid proved very appetizing and washed down with king bass was voted first rate fully compensating for our disappointment on the previous evening if our morning's rate of progress when we had only covered five miles in two hours was not exceeded it would be very late before we reached roxham broad so with as little delay as possible we made another start soon after we left the abbey it commenced raining we therefore made ourselves comfortable in the cabin reading whilst george sailed the boat alone we were just passing the entrance to a beautiful broad which the father of our visitor leases for shooting when one of the old keepers rode out of the dyke past the buttercup so he our visitor called hello w but the man did not appear to recognize him the shout was repeated and this time the broadman stopped don't you know me w suddenly the fact dawned on him that it was his young master calling and it was amusing to see how confused the discovery made him i beg your pardon sir i didn't know it was you all right w it doesn't matter good-bye and as the yacht sailed on we enjoyed a laugh at the little comedy 
I always like to introduce the members of my crew to the worthy proprietor of Horning Ferry, and in the present instance, of course, the yacht was stopped, and Mr. Thompson duly presented to our latest edition. Whilst they were talking learnedly about the chances of sport, Jack and I walked round the old hostel and interviewed Annie, Mr. Thompson's niece, and Sally, the maid of the inn, both of whom are a special favourites with the thousands of visitors who sojourn here during the summer. As we made our visit quite a flying one, perhaps this is hardly the place to enlarge on the attractions of this home from home, but as later on we shall spend an evening here, I shall certainly say more of it. Leaving the ferry, we made our way upstream, and as we passed Horning, were much amused by the chorus of Who John Barleycorn? Who John Barleycorn? All day long I raise my song to old John Barleycorn with which passing yachts are always greeted by the juvenile population of this riverside village. We had heard it was sometimes varied by another edition, so we asked the youngsters to give it us, and forthwith they chanted, John Barleycorn is dead and gone, he'll never come back no more, he's gone to sing another song upon a better shore. With this, we supposed the open-air concert had finished, but as the yacht slowly rounded into the mill reach, the refrain changed to, Let go the anchor, boys! And as we got beyond stone throw, perhaps I should say copper throw, we received not only three cheers, but three times three, many times repeated. The last salute in their childish treble sounded as pretty as the songs, and certainly was much more in tune, for obvious reasons. By this time the wind had fallen nearly all away, and as the tide, which was now in our favour, is scarcely felt here, twenty-four miles from the sea, our progress was very slow, so slow indeed, that Jack and George at last took to the dinghy and towed. This was, however, so tiring an occupation that they were soon glad to give it up. But Jack persisted that his weight must make some difference and let this form an excuse for getting his line and spinning tackle ready, hoping to entice therewith some member of the genus Esox. As it was becoming a trifle chilly, I retired into the cabin and enjoyed a quiet doze. On emerging half an hour later, I found Roxham Broad had at last been reached, but it was so dark that we had, figuratively speaking, to feel our way across. Yachts are not now allowed to spend the night on the Broad, but it happens that the proprietor of the first end is well known to our visitor so he attached his autograph to one of my cards, and this was sent up to the Broad House. A few minutes later, we received permission to stay and settle down for the night. End of chapter 7「Chapter 8 of Notes on the Broads and Rivers of Norfolk and Suffolk by Harry Britton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Roxham Broad to Little Switzerland and Horning. To our surprise, on waking the next morning, we found it a dead calm. This is a very rare thing at Roxham, as the lake is so large that there is nearly always a blow on the broad. Hoping for the best, however, we decided to have breakfast first and wait for something to turn up. Whilst this was preparing, Jack amused himself with some champagne and soda water bottles which had been thrown overboard. 
reference to the notice board at the entrance will show that this is not allowed and i beg to apologize for this breach of rule although at the time i was unaware of the injunction nearly all of these had floated and the irrepressible john broke and sank them one at a time with the oars which he threw from a distance once he threw both and had to paddle ever so far with one of the floorboards our morning meal over we hurriedly cleared away and hoisted sail but even by this time there was very little wind and we only just drew across the broad on gaining the river things were still worse and as our friend wished to catch an early train jack and i went ashore with a tow-line this proved to be very wet work as the dew hung heavily on the long grass and reeds that our exertions were not unnecessary was proved in the end as we arrived at roxham bridge with barely enough time now then george look sharp after the luggage mr y will see to the yacht and in half a minute from the time of stopping we were tearing over the meadow halfway across this i managed to go over my ankles in a bit of a bog but as i was already wet to my knees it did not much matter reaching the road we hurried on to the station and arrived just as the train was about to start well skipper what shall we do now was john's inquiry on my return to the yacht i suggest we row above the bridge to little switzerland and spin for pike on the way right you are i'm ready for anything but i think we ought to start at once if we are to do any sailing later on returned jack when we started upstream george took the oars and my friend amused himself with his rod whilst i sat in the bow reading a capital volume of queer stories from truth about a mile above the railway bridge a number of men were engaged cutting weeds with a peculiar sort of double scythe a strange-looking half-circle of sticks was arranged about a dozen yards from their field of operation to prevent the weeds floating downstream this device while stopping a large proportion was not completely successful as patches might have been seen floating miles away when we arrived at the dyke leading to little switzerland we found it quite impassable in consequence of the growth of vegetation in the channel as i wished very much for john to see something of this charming little spot we landed about half a mile higher up and walked to the bridge which crosses one part of it this bridge by the way is said to be the highest in norfolk although one goes downhill to it both ways from this point of vantage one of the most delightful views of the district can be commanded and well worth the trouble to row as far I ought to say that one can sail up the river as far as Coltishall, which is about seven miles above Wroxham, and the scenery is pretty all the way. But we did not care for the trouble of lowering our mast on this occasion, as there was so little wind. Two or three years ago, I obtained permission to have little Switzerland photographed, and the views obtained were simply charming. In my extensive collection of broad and river pictures, they certainly take a front place, as our cousins across the water would say. One cannot help expressing the hope that some day the dikes will be cleared out and this lovely sylvan retreat opened up. A friend who was looking through my views the other day was astonished when he came to the four bits of this well-named spot 
and could hardly credit that they were really photos of norfolk scenery on the way back and when nearing the bridge we found that the floating weeds had caused some mischief to the net of an eel set as it was broken away from one side and quite blocked up arrived at roxham we telegraphed to one of jack's brothers to join us at potter Hyam that night on may's assuring us that we should be certain to get as far and then went shopping we were just thinking of leaving the town the smallest village is a town in the broad district when we came across mr thompson of horning ferry hotel who was good enough to ask me if i cared to go for a drive round with him i am afraid the acceptance of this invitation looked very like desertion but the temptation was too great to be resisted of course a tidy up was necessary after our morning's work i wanted to shave but was chaffed out of it and as our friend offered to wait an hour if i liked i very quickly changed of mr thompson i will venture to say that if i could introduce every one of my readers to him personally ninety-nine out of a hundred would like him he is a most enthusiastic sportsman and the ferry shows many a trophy of his gun and rod i quite enjoyed the exhilarating drive and still more the long chat we had and felt almost sorry when at last we reached horning well mr Britton, you may rest assured your yacht won't be here yet will you have dinner with me you know you are welcome were the words which greeted me a few minutes later as i stood on the lawn beside the river looking in vain for signs of the buttercup an invitation couched in such terms was too good for a hungry man to refuse and i expressed the real pleasure i had in accepting a good dinner well cooked is one of the things the visitor may rely on at this model hotel and the present was no exception to the rule the popularity of the ferry is testified to in the visitors book which to me is a very interesting volume i nearly always asked to see it and did not miss now the autographs are in some cases most distinguished and amongst others those of the marquis of lorne and party the late duke of abercorn and lord and lady enfield will strike the eye the duke of abercorn stayed several days and was pleased with everything in his surroundings if it were necessary to find another title for the visitor's book i should call it the broads and rivers illustrated by pen and pencil whilst art is represented by pen and ink sketches sepia drawings and even watercolours of more or less pretension the pen finds expression in poetry as well as prose if i give one selection of the former mode of expression an idea will be gathered that i am not the only admirer of this quiet retreat oh don't take the high road and don't take the railroad but hear more your trim sailing wherry oh rest ye at horning and say in the morning how cosies the inn by the ferry dinner over we retired to a private sanctum of mr thompson's and cigars and sherry proved capital material wherewith to while away the time it was past five when annie announced that at last the buttercup was in sight and i of course at once boarded as she ran alongside it seemed i had been well out of a nice muddle as the wind had fallen completely away and they had to quant nearly all the way down i had been inwardly chafing all the time i had waited 
wondering what in the world we should do as to our friend at Potter Hyam. After tea, Jack suggested that we should walk over to see if his brother had arrived, and at about seven we started. When we got onto the road, however, it was so dark that we could scarcely see before us. We then decided that if our friend had turned up, he would conclude we were becalmed, and stay the night at the bridge house, the waterman's arms. So, with the determination of starting long before breakfast the next morning, we returned to the yacht. End of chapter 8Chapter 9 of Notes on the Broads and Rivers of Norfolk and Suffolk by Harry Britton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Horning to Potter Hyam and Waxham. Notwithstanding our having retired so early the night before, I felt very much inclined to have a good layout. Jack turned out, however, with George at seven o'clock and they worked with such a will that in less than half an hour I could hear the yacht had started. Such an unusual luxury as lying in bed whilst the yacht was under canvas was too good to continue long without some interruption, and presently, as we ran into a scant reach, I was very nearly following Jack's example of a few days before when I thought of wedging myself in, as it were, with the table. This expedient proved quite a success, and made me so comfortable that although the cabin doors were unshipped, I simply refused to turn out. When I at last emerged from the cabin, I seated myself on the stern sheets, just as I had left my bed. In the assurance that no one would be stirring so early in the morning, I lazily lounged about in this state of undress, enjoying the fresh breeze to the full. Presently I heard sounds of laughter ahead, and, to my discomfiture, a fishing party was passed just after. Perhaps after making such a gratuitous exhibition of yourself, you'll go inside and dress said jack i took his advice immediately and made a determination not to air myself again in a similar manner by nine o'clock we reached potter Hyam bridge and at once sent george to hear if our friend had turned up whilst we prepared breakfast this was nearly ready when our man returned and informed us that nothing had been seen or heard of any one inquiring for us. We were halfway through our meal when we were surprised to hear shouts of Buttercup ahoy! Buttercup ahoy! from the opposite side of the stream, and Jack volunteered to row over and see what was amiss. He soon returned with a telegram addressed to me, which proved to be from his missing brother announcing that it would be utterly impossible for him to come, in consequence of another engagement. I don't know if the old couplet which runs, Blessed are they who live near Potter Hyam, and doubly blessed those who live in it, may apply to temporary residence, but from events which happened on our return some days later, I am inclined to think this is not the case. When clear of the two bridges and our sails again set, a spirit of mischief appeared to possess John. In this case, poor George was the victim, and a mop was the instrument of torture used. At last George could stand it no longer, but chased Jack around the decks. Catching him, however, proved rather a difficult matter but at last the mop struck against the main shrouds and was jerked from John's hand into the water. Notwithstanding his protest that it was only an old one, 
i insisted on his either fetching it or buying me a new one when there is anything to do on board jack is one of the quickest and handiest amateurs in norfolk so a row in the dinghy for the missing mop was a very small matter accomplished in a very short space of time somehow or another even when he returned my chum could not on this particular morning rest quietly he appeared to want some object on which to vent his overflow of animal spirits and luckily for george he at last undertook to give the decks a good scrubbing i have only recently spoken of his energy on the yacht so it will not much surprise my reader when i say that positively in less time than it takes me to write he was bare to the feet and with trousers turned up to his knees had commenced operations such an example soon put my laziness to the blush and i quickly joined in the healthful exercise the cabin top also came in for a share of elbow grease and one way or another the yacht looked all the better for our exertions more especially as jack insisted on the brasswork being likewise polished up all this took some little time and we had sailed through kendall dyke and were halfway across higham sounds before we settled down to enjoy our well-earned rest i believe my yacht is the largest which now attempts the navigation of these waters and i rather glory in the fact certain it is that boats of a heavier draught lose a great deal in not being able to explore this section of the district which is perhaps the most interesting of all if i were asked to define the charm this part of our lakeland undoubtedly possesses i should be puzzled to say what i feel i think i cannot do better than quote the following passage from the introduction to lubbock's fauna of norfolk by mr southwell fellow of the zoological society let the reader drift quietly through higham sounds on a glorious night in the early autumn the dying breeze just stirring the sails of his yacht and raising the slightest possible ripple on the surface of the lake only enough to make more brilliant the moonbeam's burnished path along the water and to wake the whispering reeds the stillness broken only by the cry of some startled water bird or the splash of a monster fish as it darts into the reed beds and he will behold a scene which no artist can depict and which will haunt his memory for many a day nor will the sights and sounds on a fine night early in summer be easily forgotten during the day not a wing may have been seen but after sundown the place is alive with the song of the reed birds the air resounds with the bleat of the snipe water hens and coots are calling in all directions and many are the strange sounds borne on the soft air of evening which reach his ear the personal experience which mr southwell no doubt reflected in such poetical language it is to my mind the best word picture ever drawn of our lakes was in some way my own on an equally charming evening some years ago my yacht was moored in the dyke which branches from the northeast end of higham and whilst my companion prepared tea i rode in the dinghy across the upper end of the sounds and then through whitesley to hickling broad just as the light was deepening in such lovely tints as i fear almost to attempt to describe the sun had set in a perfect blaze of crimson like gold and the lake reflected all this in a manner almost magical 
i remember lying over the bow of my boat and watching the wonderful effects of light and shade on the mirror-like surface of the water until the gloaming deepened almost into darkness even then the sky appeared loth to relinquish its clothing of varying colour here and there a line of deep blood red remained whilst the broad retained its borrowed glory till at last night really closed in upon it i wish i could put into words all i felt that night as i lay in the little craft i stayed until i hardly dared to wait any longer so much had the enchantment of it all crept around me and on reading over my very imperfect attempt at word painting i feel how utterly bald and inexpressive it is to return to our trip and the yacht which by this time has crossed the broad and entered the old meadow dyke this channel is very narrow and winds about in the most irregular manner whilst as the yacht passes through it one's boom is often yards over the edge of the rond and appears to be sweeping down the waving rush and reed i had always up till now considered this dyke and the mere it drains about as much out of the world as any spot in east anglia on this occasion i determined on penetrating still further if possible much to the disgust of george who declared we should find ourselves landed on the mud for dares finding me obdurate he at last yielded although insisting on having the mainsail lowered so as to decrease our speed i ought to explain that the navigation we were about to attempt to explore is known as the pauling and waxham cut in the morning as we left higham an old wherryman had been most emphatic in warning us not to think of it and when at last we turned our backs on horsey mare and were fairly into the cut i must confess to wishing i had taken his advice compared with this tiny channel the old meadow dyke is a great river and it may be as well to say that a friend of mine who has since measured it finds it is under twenty feet wide in parts this only allows a space of less than a couple of yards on each side of the buttercup so it will be gathered we were cutting it rather fine when about half a mile up we felt the yacht gradually pull up and feared we had at last run aground we kept on however and presently the soft gurgling sound always heard as my boating readers know when a yacht runs on the putty ceased and we breathed a little more freely from this point there seemed to be a little more water anyway we did not ground again the oft-repeated comparison of the drainage of our norfolk marshland with that of holland would not apply anywhere with greater force than here as the marshes adjoining the tiny canal are very noticeably lower than the surface of the water the river wall or rather dyke wall is in splendid preservation and one could jump ashore with the yacht under way with the greatest ease jack and i did this several times and once or twice ran a good way ahead of the boat and then lay down flat thereby losing sight of the water and watched the buttercup pass john remarked that it was more like a dioramic effect than anything he had ever seen at last we reached waxham bridge and had some idea of trying to go on to pauling but were informed there was a floating bridge about half way which would give us a lot of trouble so we made everything snug and strolled down to the beach which is only about ten minutes walk away the large warren we had to cross 
is bordered on its eastern side by very lofty sand hills covered with marram grass acting as a safeguard against possible inroads by the sea it was great fun to climb these banks although it reminded one of the irishman who went two steps backward every one he took forward it was i thought on gaining the summit very peculiar to notice on one side the diminutive channel of fresh water with the buttercup's mast standing out very boldly in the general flatness and then on the other to watch the ships at sea i don't know if this peculiarity is absolutely unique but i should not think many similar instances could be adduced on the coastline of our tight little isle it was really a most delightful change to get to the seashore once again and we enjoyed to the full the novelty lying prominently on the beach was a stranded porpoise dead and as we neared it jack commenced throwing the largest stones he could find with all his force at the carcass as one result of this it gave forth a most pestiferous odour and we were glad to get out of its way larking about like schoolboys the time very quickly passed and i for one was not sorry when we at last started for the buttercup and dinner on our way over the banks george suggested we should each fill our handkerchiefs with the beautifully clean sand for use on the decks which somehow were not looking so white as they should this we agreed to and collected enough to last the entire trip on our return to the yacht george started on the preparation of a grand stew my man i may say is especially great on stews and we amused ourselves by reading presently somebody asked for a knife and i then discovered that i had lost a beautiful one given me by my two chums jack and braddy a few months previously as i remembered using it just before we started for the beach i had no doubt i dropped it on the sands i therefore determined to walk down and have a good look before breakfast the next morning dinner over jack continued his book and i tried to make some notes but somehow could not get my loss out of my head so i gave it up as a bad job at about nine o'clock we were so tired that we discussed the advisability of turning in it happened that george had been missing for half an hour or so and i was just inquiring where he had gone when one of the sliding hatches which divide my cabin from the forepeak opened and the individual in question commenced passing our beds and rugs through this very broad hint we very willingly fell in with and as jack remarked when the lights were extinguished it was the earliest time on record end of chapter nine Chapter 10 of Notes on the Broads and Rivers of Norfolk and Suffolk by Harry Britton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Waxham to Pauling. Waking at seven in the morning, I determined to start at once in search of my knife. Jack, of course, had not to be asked twice whether he would accompany me. In fact, he was the first ready to start leaving george to get breakfast ready and promising to be back by nine o'clock we started my friend taking one side of the road and i the other our most careful search was not however rewarded with success and when we at last very reluctantly turned our backs on the shore i felt awfully disappointed all this about such a comparatively simple loss may sound a little strained 
perhaps but i do hate the idea of losing anything given me by a friend we had just crossed the warren when we met george who had been on a hunt for eggs and had been successful in getting some of the finest i have ever seen out of a show our walk had given us capital appetites not that this was anything uncommon as this book is of course intended to be useful to excursionists on our waters i may as well say that in estimating the quantity of provisions necessary for a fortnight or a week's trip it would be as well to consult a friend who has done the broads as to what had better be taken i would suggest that although many excellent specialities are to be found in the way of tin food too much of this should not be bought with an experienced skipper one can nearly always find up fresh meat which can be cooked on board in my own boat i have three methylated spirit stoves so that as many operations can be carried on at once i think by the way that if i were in the position of hiring a yacht i should insist on nothing but spirit being used for the stoves as it is far and away ahead of paraffin no matter how careful one is with the latter there is always some smell of the oil about at least that is my experience to return to the buttercup we decided after breakfast to take the dinghy beyond the bridge and up to Pauling. the dyke becomes very narrow above waxham so much so in fact that rowing in even so small a boat as my dinghy became nearly impossible george at last volunteered to go ashore and tow and by this means we got on at a very fair rate about a mile from our starting point our further progress was stopped by the identical floating bridge we had heard of the day before this i might explain can be hauled into a square place cut for the purpose on the east side of the dyke as it is however a very substantial structure we elected to haul the dinghy out and launch it again on the other side this accomplished we continued our trip jack taking the tow line at length we reached the end of our journey finding further progress arrested by a little three-arch bridge as i have called them arches i must i suppose allow the word to stand but i ought perhaps to explain that they are so small that one can scarcely crawl through it happens i have a great weakness for exploring the intricacies of our system of waterways to their very sources if possible so in this case i suggested taking the dinghy out and making another start but on the suggestion of george we first made inquiries at a house a short distance away as to how much further we could get the small boy who answered the door was certainly the most stupid specimen of a country yokel i ever met on being interrogated as to whether it would be of any use trying to push our way upstream he didn't know further questions in the shape of inquiries where his father or mother was elicited the same reply and when we at last gave him up as a bad job we almost believed his limited vocabulary simply consisted of the two words mentioned i may inform the enthusiast in the matter of compulsory education that there is a pauling and waxham school board fortunately we were met just after leaving by a native who seemed as intelligent as the one we had left was the reverse 
from him we learned it would be quite useless our attempting to go any higher as progress is completely barred at a mill he pointed out about a couple of hundred yards up the cut never mind said jack i vote we walk to Pauling, and with this he started off talking and acting are always synonymous terms with my friend at all events such is the case when he is on pleasure bent there is little of special interest at Pauling. it is simply a fishing village of the ordinary pattern a lifeboat station unfortunately too much of a necessity on this part of the coast a little square sort of house where the coast guard is domiciled then a number of boats lying on the beach with the usual loungers who appear to be ever on the lookout for something which never comes all this with a few scattered houses here and there and the sand hills in the background will give a fair idea of the place at least as seen from the seashore after toiling through the sandy street which runs directly down to the beach we decided on walking along the shore to the ruins of eccles church about a mile and a half away the tide was quite out and the stroll on the sands which are perfectly clear of stones or shingle was delightful the enthusiastic devotees of lawn tennis who have within the last few years located themselves at nearly every watering place would i am sure consider this unsurpassable stretch of sand a tennysonian paradise certain it is a more suitable spot could not be found it proved so tempting to me that i bared my feet and paddled the whole way to eccles the ruins of the church of st mary which stand out so boldly on the shore offer a very striking illustration of the inroads of the sea at this point and one cannot fail to be struck with wonder at the lofty tower remaining intact for so many years yet there it remains a silent tribute to the thoroughness with which our forefathers built their temples from the sand hills at this point haysborough lighthouse can be plainly seen and in the exuberance of animal spirits which is the best testimony to the health-giving character of a holiday of this description i rush to the summit ignoring the prickly marum grass which however played havoc with my bare feet as i found to my cost on returning to the shore that's what you get by playing said jack as i limped along and to show his superior sense he immediately commenced larking with george when about a mile from Pauling, we overtook a very saline looking specimen of humanity who had regarded my movements on the hulk of a small lugger which was lying a wreck on the shore with much suspicion whether he thought i intended carrying off any of the scrap iron which was about the only movable thing left i cannot say but he appeared much relieved when we at last left the wrecked vessel he proved to be a member of the lifeboat crew and as we appeared interested in the inevitable yarn he was of course commenced to spin he gradually thawed and by the time we left him was voted a decent sort after all as it was now just two o'clock we decided on stopping to have something to eat Pauling was all alive on this particular day and we wondered what the bustle could mean on making inquiries we found a large sale had been held at the adjoining village which attracted people from a distance the refreshment of the inner man complete we resumed our return to the cut on arrival at which we made a start in the dinghy at once 
as some very heavy looking storm clouds were gathering and we feared being caught in a shower we were not however destined to escape as we had scarcely got half a mile on our journey when it commenced raining very heavily as we had provided ourselves with overcoats we did not much care but luckily it soon left off when we reached the floating bridge the same tactics of course had to be adopted much to the amusement of an old labourer who stood watching the operation did not take long to complete and when the boat was again launched our old friend broke the ice by remarking you seem to be quite used to that sort of thing as he appeared to be rather an original we stopped chatting with him some little time and heard a great deal about the drainage etc of the surrounding land and the benefit it had been to the district we were much amused too by the reports he had heard of the big yacht at waxham he wanted to know if it was one of them loins boots and when informed by john that the writer hereof was the owner he expressed the hope that he might see us again on some future occasion it is just possible the glass of beer with which he drank our very good health may have had something to do with his extra friendliness but this i must leave although i would especially impress on the intending tourist mind that a drink is never thrown away we hope to have been able to leave waxham and moor on horsey mere for the night but we had scarcely reached the yacht when it again commenced raining heavily this was rather disheartening as although a trip to these confined waters might be very nice by the way of novelty it was not altogether the place where one would care to spend a week after dinner as there seemed to be no chance of the weather clearing up we resigned ourselves to another quiet evening john with his books and i with my diary i tell you what it is skipper i could do a glass of fizz couldn't you said jack when i had nearly fallen asleep over my work the very thing my boy and almost before the words were out of my mouth george had bolted forward for a bottle clearly he had acquired a taste for the king of wines at Acol a few days before discussion of the next day's movements over we turned in and slept as only they can sleep who spend their days in the full enjoyment of perfect health End of chapter 10chapter eleven of notes on the broads and rivers of norfolk and suffolk by harry britton this librivox recording is in the public domain pauling to hickling and martham on waking the next morning at about six o'clock i found to my extreme delight the sun was shining through the doors of the cabin I lost very little time in waking my chum and maze, and then we called a committee to decide on the day's movements. We eventually came to the conclusion that we would try to get to Hickling Broad before breakfast. First and foremost, said John, how are we to get out of this blessed dyke? It's quite certain we can't swing the boat. We shan't lose anything by tryin, retorted George, so we set to work. The buttercup is fifty feet long from the stern to the end of the bowsprit, and we found it quite an impossibility to get her round, although we tried to lift her bowsprit over the rond. Having disposed of suggestion, the first, there remained the alternatives of either towing out stern first which i scarcely need say would have been a most laborious process 
or fixing the weights on the mast lowering and quanting the boat through the bridge just beyond which a large dyke had been cut from the main channel the latter was the plan ultimately selected but when we attempted to again swing the yacht round we found it no easy matter as although there was plenty of water in the middle of the stream the sides were extremely fleet at last however with george on the quant and jack and i with lines attached to the stern and bow we just managed to accomplish our object after again quanting through the bridge and raising the mast to its normal position we found the wind so high that we had to stay to reef the sails but at last we were under way by eight o'clock the run through the cut was soon over and we enjoyed the sail over the lovely mere to the full on gaining the old meadow dyke we found we should have a head wind to contend with nearly all the way through and as tacking in so narrow a channel was quite impossible jack and i went ashore with a tow-line there's no mistake about it mate this is having a constitutional before breakfast with a vengeance said john as we slowly made headway presently we turned a corner so to speak and the yacht drew away we however held on to the tow-line which was a good long one rather than jump aboard although george insisted that this would be the better course as it happened we were made to pay for our obstinacy we had allowed the buttercup to take the whole length when in pushing our way through some tall rushes we saw when too late a broad dyke immediately in front we had jumped several but this was one too many for us of course we had to let go the line and george yelled that he would bring the boat up this he did directly he could and then rowed back for us in the dinghy one way and another we lost nearly half an hour by this little blunder and as i still insisted on getting to our proposed destination before breakfast signs of mutiny began to show it was a distinct relief when we at last emerged from the little dyke and again crossed the sounds i might perhaps say for the information of any who may come after me that the channel to hickling and catfield across the reedy expanse of higham is quite distinct from the one we have just navigated a yacht coming through kendal dyke must keep an even course for a belt of reeds which stands out very prominently to the west of the lake arrived at this point and to gain the old meadow dyke the course must then be altered and the first of three large posts which are very conspicuous steered for by the time these are passed at a distance of say ten feet the mouth of the old meadow channel shows itself on the present occasion we were about to attempt another passage and on arriving at the belt of reeds i have just mentioned went about roughly speaking i should say at an angle of thirty degrees northwest of our former course keeping straight ahead a river-like channel of very respectable width is gained and through this again a tiny lakelet called whitesley widens out this broad we crossed in fear and trembling expecting every moment to find ourselves on the mud but to our extreme delight no such catastrophe occurred once across whitesley another river-like space appears but rather more contracted than the one i have just mentioned this channel leads direct to our largest broad but as there was a big wind blowing 
we decided on this occasion not to attempt the passage although we felt pretty confident we should have crossed in safety we pulled up if i may use the term just below an eel set from which we could command a very fair view of the lake when we had lowered the sails and made everything temporarily snug and whilst george started on the preparation of our long delayed breakfast we had time to look about us to any who reach this point one fact must be especially apparent that is the extreme purity of the water at the spot where my yacht was moored i am quite sure there is not less than twelve feet of water and yet the bottom can be distinctly seen our morning meal over we busied ourselves with a regular clear-up the rain of the last few days had made not a few things very damp and wet and we determined to make the most of this glorious morning by getting everything dried our flag halyards looked quite gay with the various coloured socks we tied there too george remarked that it seemed like a regatta whilst the main shrouds were called into requisition as a drying ground for three or four pairs of flannel unmentionables etc afterwards jack and i went ashore and gave the dinghy a thorough clean-out of which it was sadly in need when we started for hickling in the dinghy it was past eleven although both jack and i agreed it seemed almost impossible for the time to have passed so quickly the present was my friend's first sight of hickling broad and he was extremely delighted with its grand appearance this beautiful lake is the largest sheet of water in the district and covers between four and five hundred acres as i have before said the wind was blowing very strong raising quite respectable waves which as we rowed across washed frequently into the boat as we had no wish to get wet through we ultimately decided to make for catfield dyke and then under the lee of the tall rushes which fringed the sides of the broad to row to hickling staithe by this means we managed to cheat the swell although it made our trip very much longer than we expected or wished when we at last landed we lost no time in making tracks for the village where we hoped to get a supply of fresh meat bread eggs etc to our disgust however we found we were a day late for the butcher so for that day's dinner we should have to fall back on our reserve this by the way consisted of tins of mccall's paysandu ox tongue which i can strongly recommend the general shopkeeper at hickling is i should think about as good a salesman as one is likely to meet our appearance of course betrayed that we were boating men and one way and another by the time we managed to escape from the store we were all laden with packages of very respectable dimensions i ought to add however that everything mr ward supplied was of first-rate quality we were just leaving the village when john who was a little bit ahead suddenly exclaimed i'm blessed if there isn't old joe allen with his man mark coming up the road old joe allen be it known was a yachting colleague owner of a beautiful little four-tonner called the violet here's a rum go said our friend as we met who should have thought of meeting you in this out-of-the-world place talk of the meeting of livingstone and stanley it was simply nowhere chaffed jack as we shook hands it then transpired that the violet had that morning fetched potter Hyam, and as her draught would not allow of her navigating the sounds they had sailed up in their dinghy 
as our friend had never been to hickling before we went for a stroll in company first leaving our packages at a convenient inn as there is not much to see this did not take very long and then we returned to the pleasure boat the name of the house that adjoins the staith the skipper of the violet very kindly offered to give us a tow over the broad and we were only too glad to accept his courtesy by the time we reached the buttercup where our friend left us as he wanted to see horsey mere the wind had so much fallen that we deemed it advisable to shake the reefs out of the sails and start with as little delay as possible as we crossed the sounds we could see the white sail of violet junior far away up the old meadow dyke and dipped our flag as a sort of complimentary signal whether this was seen or not i must leave as i quite forgot to ask when we met later in the evening when we gained the hundred stream as the thurn is called above higham we turned up river which gradually narrows beyond martham ferry and again lowered sail at the mouth of the dyke leading to martham broad at this point the main channel appears to be lost in the marsh but jack and i attempted to force our way through the swampy jungle in this way we penetrated for perhaps fifty yards and then gave up further attempts as our olfactory nerves were assailed by odours the reverse of pleasant we now rode up martham dyke to the broad of the same name crossing which we landed at somerton staith where a large pleasure wherry was lying about half way up the dyke was dammed across and beyond this about a dozen men were at work throwing out the soil looking down at the sturdy specimens of humanity engaged in this laborious occupation i could not help remarking to john on the great height of several of them this might have been a veritable land of giants and indeed is the birthplace of hales who was seven feet six inches high and weighed four hundred and fifty two pounds looking through the directory since i find there is still quite a colony of the hales at somerton and possibly some of the men i speak of rejoiced in the same name just to stretch our legs as john put it we walked round the village and stayed till the light showed signs of waning then we endeavoured to make up for lost time and made such a rush for the staith that we lost ourselves a friendly native however put us on the right track and we found our way to the dinghy once on board the boat we made her fly through the water disturbing many a winged denizen of rush and reed once as jack rested on his oars we heard a heavy splash and at the same moment a number of wildfowl rose a little further along an eel setter who was waiting for us to pass before fixing his nets told us he had no doubt the disturbance was caused by an otter of which there were several supposed to be lurking in the neighbourhood reaching the buttercup we found george rather grumpy at our long absence and suggesting we had better stay where we were for the night this hardly accorded with our ideas so we set to work and in a very short space of time were under way by the time we reached the bridges it was quite dark and a little difficulty was experienced in making all snug thanks however to it being a rule on the buttercup to have everything in the right place we were soon able to turn in and discuss dinner for which we were quite ready it had been arranged that george should run over to yarmouth just to see his missus 
and to get a fresh supply of provisions etc but we sat so long over our meal that it became a question as to whether he would be able to catch the train leaving us to clear up he made a start just about twelve minutes before the train was due arranging to throw three lighted matches into the river from the carriage window as he passed over the bridge there's one thing we may make almost sure of said jack that is the train will be half an hour late i hope it may be so but shouldn't care to bet on it john's prediction proved to be a correct one as it was fully thirty minutes overdue when it started from the station of course we watched for the signal from george and as the train thundered over the bridge we saw the three lights which he threw out one after the other shall we row through the bridges and ask the captain of the violet to come up for an hour or two suggested jack the very thing my boy i intended to have suggested it myself so we rowed down and the violets promised to come as soon as they had finished dinner they like ourselves had stayed too long exploring as our friend said he should be quite an hour we strolled up to the village and happened to drop across the station master who i should say has rather a hard time of it being the solitary monarch of all he surveys for sometimes sixteen hours a day he had grand ideas of what might happen to his company the eastern and midlands if ever a harbour of refuge was opened in the vicinity of horsey or Pauling, as was suggested a few years ago that this is a very real necessity none who see the wreck chart annually issued by the royal national lifeboat institution can doubt no spot on the coastline of the united kingdom is so thickly dotted with the tiny black spots which in each case represent a wreck in such a country there is always special need for crews to man the lifeboats and right nobly is the demand met the men of caister equally with those of Pauling, are always ready of a dreadful calamity which befell the crew of the former boat a few years since i must not here give more than passing mention about midnight of the twenty first of july eighteen eighty five a vessel was seen to be in difficulties and fifteen caister fishermen put off in a yawl unfortunately they ran into the mast of a submerged wreck their craft was stove in and only seven of the brave fellows were saved whilst i can scarcely help paying a tribute to their bravery i must add that i think the construction of a harbour of refuge on this part of the coast is really necessary and should engage the early attention of the government the importance of this subject will i hope be accepted as sufficient apology for the digression but i must now return to my narrative wishing our friend the station master good night we hastened back to the buttercup fearing captain allen might call and find us out a hail from the bridge was at once answered by the owner of the violet informing us he was just coming a few minutes later we were joined on board by the worthy skipper and at once launched into a conversation on things aquatic i don't know how it is but if two or more men who are practically interested in this subject once start on it there seems to be no end to the variety of aspects in which their hobby can be discussed so it was now and smoking contentedly we talked on and on neither thinking nor caring how time was going sailors are generally given the palm for yarn spinning but i almost think the fresh-water variety 
are equally fond of detailing their various experiences i cannot even pretend to recall all that passed in this way on the night i now speak of if i did i am quite sure the ordinary reader would throw my book on one side in disgust but when i say it was past one o'clock before we parted for the night it will be gathered that we were interested at all events End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of notes on the broads and rivers of norfolk and suffolk by harry Britton. this librivox recording is in the public domain potter Hyam to acle notwithstanding the lateness of the hour when we turned in on the night previous we were out by six o'clock getting through the bridge or bridges was the first item in the day's programme and it proved rather a stiff job as the wind was blowing directly upstream we had made up our minds to do this before george returned and after a great deal of really hard work with the quant succeeded we found we were not the only early risers as the violets were hard at work on their decks when george at last turned up everything was in apple pie order on board even the brasswork had come in for a share of our unwanted energy during breakfast whilst looking through a daily paper which had been brought us from yarmouth i came across an item of news which threw a damper over our spirits for some time it was the report of the death of one arthur sabberton who lost his life in nobly attempting to save another from drowning it happens that i wrote for hunt's yachting magazine in eighteen eighty five a series of papers called fourteen days afloat the holiday it detailed was a success in every sense of the term owing mainly to the exertions of the one who had now two years and a half later met his death like a hero in endeavouring to save a helpless woman we had arranged for a day's sail some time during our trip with a friend at martham and intended walking over but somehow the morning slipped away so rapidly that we elected to go by rail arrived at our friend's house we learnt he had gone to yarmouth so we left a message for him to start by the first train next morning for barton or rather for stalham which is the nearest station to the broad named whilst i do not profess or claim to be anything of an archaeologist i have rather a weakness for looking into old buildings the tourist with a similar taste should not omit to inspect martham church which was restored in excellent taste in eighteen fifty five most local works contain reference to a certain christopher burraway who was buried here and i do not doubt at various times his tombstone has been the shrine of many curious pilgrims whose sole object was to read the inscription thereon i may say this morbid feeling can no longer be gratified as when the restoration was carried out the stone was very wisely placed out of sight under the organ on returning to our home on the water we of course informed george of the arrangement we had made for the next day there's one thing to be said about startin suggested george the violet has had quite enough of it and stopped looking downstream we could see what george said was perfectly true our next-door neighbour of the morning had indeed given it up as a bad job our after-experience went to prove mr allen had acted wisely 
as when we were on the fifth tack we heard an ugly crash and snap went the boom at the gooseneck running the boat into the wind was a move accomplished in about the same time it takes to tell we then found the iron had run through the mainsail and made a nasty slit and as my suit of canvas was quite new i thought this rather hard lines i ought perhaps to have mentioned before that there is just below potter Hyam bridge a very picturesque boat-house kept by a mr applegate where all kinds of craft sailing and otherwise are let it sometimes happens that a yacht lies here so we made inquiries as to whether they had a spare boom they could lend us mrs applegate thought they had but the one which was eventually produced proved about seven feet too short so we decided to find up the village carpenter and hear if he could do anything in the way of splicing our spar after hammering at this individual's door about half a dozen times a neighbour informed us that he was gone out on our way back to the boat we held a sort of council to discuss the best way out of the difficulty and ultimately we came to the conclusion that it would be best for george to start by the next train for yarmouth and get a new spar made as quickly as possible having settled on this plan i hurriedly wrote an order and instructed george to do all he could to persuade the spar makers to start on it directly i take this opportunity of again acknowledging the courtesy of a yacht owner who was in the train in offering to lend us the boom of his yacht the gazelle he could of course see what had happened as my broken spar was lashed to the footboard of the break and i am pleased to mention the incident as showing the kindly feeling which generally obtains amongst norfolk boating men on our return for the second time to the buttercup we met a small boy carrying a huge turnip and visions of the use it would be to george in the preparation of one of his stews induced me to open negotiations for its purchase presently a penny changed hands and i of course took the turnip to my surprise the youngster immediately took to his heels and jack exclaimed you may depend the little wretch stole it the fresh earth round the roots and the close proximity of a field of the same vegetable seemed to indicate that my chum's assumption was correct when later on we walked over to martham to inform our friend of our mishap we learned he had just before again left for yarmouth so leaving a message for him to go to potter Hyam instead of barton as previously arranged we started back not in the best humour although it was now pitch dark we had no doubt of our way having gone over the road several times before our disgust may perhaps be better imagined than described when at last the fact gradually forced itself on us that we had taken a wrong turn a little way ahead as it seemed we could see a light which probably emanated from some farmhouse where we hoped to be put on the right track we therefore made for this with as little delay as possible but were surprised at the time it took us we might almost have been chasing a will-o'-the-wisp but the flat surface of the country round probably accounted for the delusion a good idea will be gained of the unbroken character of the region of the broads when i say that on a clear night the lights of norwich fifteen miles and yarmouth ten and a half miles can be clearly seen from the bridge at potter Hyam. when we ultimately reached the farm the good folk were just retiring for the night 
and our inquiries were answered from the bedroom window it seemed we had gone a great deal out of our way and it required some little amount of explanation before we could make quite sure of the directions given this was a lively finish to a lively day and indeed when we reviewed the day's experiences before turning in it seemed that nothing but ill luck had followed us all through to begin with we had read of poor sabberton's death then we twice missed our friend at martham and now to say nothing of the smashed boom and torn sail we had finished up by losing ourselves i really think i should have set this day's incidents apart and called it a chapter of accidents the next day opened gloriously there was not a cloud to be seen and we could the better enjoy all this as we had nothing whatever to do thanks to our exertions of the previous morning after we had started the kettle john went for a bit of a row in the dinghy and on his return i took the boat and extemporized a sail with a folding chair belonging to the yacht i found i could run upstream splendidly as i had a stern breeze but getting back was quite a different matter for tacking was of course out of the question lowering sail or rather folding up the chair i started to row and although i am very fond of this exercise as a rule i was quite tired out on reaching the buttercup we had nearly finished our meal when on happening to look out i saw r our friend from martham and whom we had given up coming along the road although we very much wished for his company on board i must confess to almost wishing we had never asked him to come under the circumstances as if our boom did not arrive by the next train we could not possibly start before four in the afternoon perhaps i ought not to have said this but i know him too well to fear giving offence by the remark our feelings of vexation and annoyance will be understood when i state that the train arrived without bringing our much wanted spa or george it now became a question as to how we should fill up our time for the next four hours or so and our friend volunteered a suggestion which we at once agreed to it happens that he has the right of shooting over the marshes east of kendall dyke so we hired a sailing boat of mr law's at the waterman's arms and tried our luck with a gun over the marshes i mentioned the old martham coursing meeting used to be held and must have offered a fine field for the pursuit of that enjoyable sport beyond running about like three schoolboys we did not do much execution with our gun of course the usual number of chances were missed and when we returned to the boat our total bag consisted of a very fine leveret it's better than nothing at all sang jack and what's more it will make a very fine stew on regaining the river we had to tack and as this was very slow work john volunteered to tow us back so he went ashore with a line and rushed the little boat along at a fine rate presently he came to a part of the rond where the river had overflowed and we suggested he should come aboard but with his usual contempt for trifles of this kind nothing would induce him to take our advice and he walked straight through with water up to his ankles this happened several times but despite all our remonstrances he persisted in saying it didn't matter the new boom was lying on the grass by the side of the yacht when we arrived and as george said 
didn't look a very likely one to carry away in a hurry after bending the sail on and before starting we had to run up to the house and square up for the boat etc before leaving the waterman's arms i ought to say the accommodation offered by mr laws is fairly comfortable and staying visitors will find everything scrupulously clean and the cooking good fishing men coming from a distance should write beforehand to make sure of obtaining rooms although lodgings could also probably be obtained in the village this point may be considered as headquarters for a very extensive fishing country as it completely covers the thern with higham sounds etc leave for angling on the sounds by the way can be granted by mr applegate near the bridge whilst the ormsby section of the district can be easily reached by train it may perhaps have been noticed that with two exceptions i have made no reference to our fishing during the trip the fact is although i always keep rods and tackle on board i very rarely use them and in explanation of this i may say that my yacht takes up so much of my time that the opportunities seem to be few and far between of course if i happen to be a really enthusiastic disciple of the gentle isaac i should probably make use of my chances but at present my yachting hobby stands first and foremost and amateur yachtsmen know full well that there is always something to do on board to return to my narrative daylight was showing signs of waning when we again sailed on the waters of the bure but somehow on this lovely finish of an indian summer day the twilight was slow to make itself apparent the sun had gone down in a misty halo of purple light and the afterglow had an altogether indescribable effect on the waterway as we drifted rather than sailed so slight was the faintly felt zephyr which filled our sails toward our night's stopping place we sat and lay about forward chatting of this and that and forming plans for future trips entirely heedless of the occasional grumble from george who declared we should not reach acle by midnight in our then frame of mind we did not care for his complainings but at last as the gloaming deepened it became colder and we discovered that we were exceedingly hungry we then elected to relieve george of his charge so that he could start on the preparation of dinner at once he therefore disappeared down the forepeak and presently our appetites were whetted by the savoury smell of beefsteak coming through the hatchway when at length we were snug for the night george's cooking was pronounced excellent and in this connection i would suggest that all visitors to the broads should dine late i always consider the middle of the day as too precious to be wasted in the cooking of food so on the buttercup we simply lunch at about one o'clock and at the end of our day's excursion while some of the crew busy themselves in making everything snug others prepare dinner in this way the most is made of the holiday on the water and i commend our plan to all my brother amateur yachtsmen in norfolk and suffolk as well as those coming from a distance who of course wish to see as much as possible of the district later on we walked up to the rising little town of acle which is about a mile and a half from the river the worthy proprietor of the chief hotel in the place the queen's head mr pierce was requisitioned for a horse and trap to drive our friend r back to martham and as he was in no particular hurry 
we stayed chatting long after the horse was put in. Eventually, we made a start at about ten o'clock, and accompanied R as far as the bridge, where we wished him good-bye. We expected George would have been waiting for us at the bridge house, but to our surprise found the favourite old inn in darkness. Evidently, the good folk had all gone to bed, so we went on a hunt for the dinghy, which we concluded must have been left somewhere about. To our extreme disgust, however, the boat was nowhere to be seen, and we had, therefore, to start along the river wall to where the buttercup was lying. Arrived at this, we sheltered ourselves nearly hoarse, but without waking up George, who had apparently followed the example of the people of the house, and turned in. I ought, perhaps, to explain that part of the rond which intervened the river wall and the yacht, which corresponds on a smaller scale to the washers of the Fen district, was covered with water. Of course, we could not tell with any certainty the depth of this, as a sort of swampy bog generally covered the inner half of the space now completely submerged. Tired of waiting about in the cold, we at last determined to go through and chance what might happen. As a precaution, we took off our shoes and socks, and turned up our flannels as far as we could get them. Having made up our minds for a wetting, we did not stay to think about it, but rushed through as quickly as possible, the water coming just above our knees. Shaking with cold, and angry at having to go through such an experience, I hurled my shoes aboard, and the next moment heard a heavy splash, leaving no doubt one had gone into the water. When we boarded the lugger, as one of my friends insists on calling the buttercup, later, I found that such was indeed the case. I might, perhaps, have mentioned that when we rode to the house earlier in the evening, we had noticed how distinctly phosphorescent the water was. Before we now came on board, we observed another curious instance of the effect of this in the fact that in walking along the rond, our footmarks left a distinct impression, and little dots, not unlike electric sparks, were plainly observable. I scarcely need say that we made haste to divest ourselves of our sodden unmentionables, and fully appreciated the snug and warm little cabin, where our man had fortunately left lights burning. At no time during our trip had we felt so tired out as we did that night, and when we got into bed and wished each other good night, we fell asleep the instant the lights were out. I have used the expression, got into bed, and as this sounds perhaps a little too civilised for a small yacht like mine, I beg to say the phrase is correct in every sense. In explanation of this, I ought to give particulars as to how it is managed. The details are very simple. A blanket, best doubled, is sandwiched, as it were, between an inner sheet and an outer coverlet. The whole is then sewn together, and your bed is complete. The dodge is an old one to boating men but I question if it is possible to improve on it. The great feature of this arrangement is that you cannot possibly kick the things off during the night, and although I am often chaffed about my bags, I mean to keep to them, as beating all the rugs in existence. Of course, rough temporary adaptations of this excellent plan can be brought from a distance, but my own are permanent features of the boat, and I never turn in without blessing my dear little mother for the extra trouble she took in making them. End of chapter 12
Chapter 13 of Notes on the Broads and Rivers of Norfolk and Suffolk by Harry Britton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Acle to Roxham Bridge. Since the opening of the railway from Norwich to Yarmouth, which intersects Acle, the latter place has become one of the most popular of our fishing and yachting stations. It was anciently a market town, and bids fair to attain to something of its former importance, as well-attended stock sales are now held every week. Latterly, too, a corn market has been established, and a branch bank opened. Possibly the facilities offered by the excellent inn at the riverside, of which I shall have something more to say, as well as the Queen's Head, King's Head, etc., have something to do with the annually increasing incursion of visitors. Certain it is, however, that nowhere in the district can better sport be obtained, whether on fishing or yachting bent, the tourist will have difficulty in finding more suitable ground. Just to show piscators at a distance what they may expect, I may say that one boat, in rowing from the bridge to St. Benedict's Abbey and back last year, landed 22 pike. This freshwater shark was caught in very large numbers all the season, but I think the catch, I record, was the largest although I know of two other halls of sixteen and eighteen. I may say that boats are let by Mr. Benz at the Hermitage Stathe, but undoubtedly the station which is most convenient in every way is the Bridge Inn. The worthy host and hostess, Mr. and Mrs. Rose, do all in their power to make visitors comfortable, and, in addition, Mr. Rose is, one who knows, all about the fishing. That he practices the gentle art with some success is evidenced by the well-preserved specimens of the finny tribe which adorn the walls of the house. One case contains a brace of very fine salmon trout, whilst another exhibits an enormous pike, and others show roach, bream, etc., in more or less natural attitudes. During breakfast, George remarked that this would have been just the morning for fishing, but it happened that we had a friend coming from Norwich for the day, so we spent the time in tidying up, the process which is always in progress on a yacht, but never completed. Then, Leaving instructions for all to be ready for a start on my return, I rode down to the bridge, where Jay, Mr. Rose's man, was waiting to drive me to the station. With the punctuality which generally obtains on the Great Eastern Railway, the train arrived to the minute, and, indeed, it may not be out of place to give a word of praise to the company for the general facilities they offer the boating public. Well, Britain, I couldn't have picked a lovelier day if I had tried, was my friend's remark as we shook hands. And, indeed, it was a perfect day, neither too hot nor too cold, whilst overhead the sky was cloudless. The air, too, was so clear and bracing that it seemed almost to give new life. This latter particular constitutes a special feature of the Broad District, as probably nowhere in England would it be possible to find greater purity of atmosphere. A writer in a London journal recently spoke of the malaria-giving Norfolk waters. I thought this fallacy was exploded years ago, and I challenge him to prove a single instance of the effects he alleges. I claim to know what I am talking about on this subject, as I have slept out at all times, from the beginning of April to the end of October, 
for the last five or six years the fact too that a very numerous class live afloat the whole year round says something for the salubrity of our waterways of course i refer to the wherrymen than whom a finer race of bargees does not exist we got under way at about eleven o'clock with wind and tide in our favour in about the third reach from the bridge an old mill dating as far back as seventeen fifty three stands very near the river and as we passed it george spun us a terrific yarn of how once upon a time a wherry was caught by the whirling sails and had her gaff and i think he added mast carried away whilst i cannot personally vouch for the truth of this tale i must admit that sometimes the sails appear to come uncomfortably near just past this if one keeps one's eyes open two church towers will be seen in the distance strangely near to each other they are in fact in the same churchyard at south walsham and the churches are respectively dedicated to st mary and st lawrence the latter was burnt down in a fearful fire which occurred on the thirtieth of june eighteen twenty seven that it was a very fierce one will be gathered when i mention that one of the bells was completely melted the church was rebuilt in eighteen thirty two although one can hardly understand why it should have been thought necessary our visitor having expressed the wish to look round st benedict's abbey the yacht was brought up and he and i rowed across to inspect the ruins the original settlement of a monastic body here probably dates back a thousand years by ten twenty the monastery had become so powerful that canute created it a mitred benedictine abbey tradition says that about half a century later it withstood a siege by the conqueror until it was betrayed by a member of the order the traitor appears to have made a bargain that he should be created abbot as the price of his crime but it affords one a certain grim satisfaction to know that immediately after this was carried out he was hanged it has been frequently said that the bishop of norwich is also abbot of st benedict's the only one in england this is accounted for by the fact that the abbey of st benet's at holm was never really suppressed i may perhaps be allowed a slight digression to tell how this came about or rather did not come about at the time that henry the eighth was making such efforts to rid himself of catherine the abbot of st benedict's was one william rugg who rendered himself conspicuous by his arguments in favour of the divorce this william rugg who appears to have been as unscrupulous as he was well informed foresaw the probable dissolution of monastic establishments throughout the country and resolved to turn his advocacy of the king's cause to account events seemed to favour his designs for in fifteen thirty five bishop nix of norwich died and rugg resolved if possible to obtain the vacant appointment to do this he suggested to henry that the revenues then pertaining to the bishopric should revert to the crown and that in place thereof it should in future depend upon those of the priory of hickling and the monastery of st benedict's the king of course fell in with the idea an act was passed sanctioning the transfer and the abbot was duly installed as bishop of norwich in this way the abbey was never dissolved but its poverty soon led to its decay the abbey gateway is now all that remains of the once magnificent pile 
although at some little distance away, parts of the old walls can be traced. The old porch has suffered at the hands of utilitarians who erected thereon a mill, but this is falling into ruin so much faster than the work of our forefathers that a few generations hence it will probably have entirely disappeared. We spent some little time in looking round the time-hallowed relics of a bygone day, and then rode back to the buttercup, and were soon again under way. I wish it were in my power to put into words a tithe of the pure enjoyment afforded by a trip on the water on such a lovely day as this. I feel, indeed, that the whole narrative of our cruise falls far, very far, short of adequately describing not only the district, but the amount of real pleasure experienced. I have already referred to a paper I contributed to Hunt's Yachting Magazine. Besides this, I happen to have written several other articles, and sometimes my friends ask me if I am not getting tired of writing about my favourite hobby. Some say, too, that my enthusiasm is too great to last. I can honestly affirm, in answer to all this, that I am looking forward to season 87 with greater zest than ever, and that although our system of waterways is to me an open book, I always find something new to attract an interest in every succeeding excursion. Of course we stop at the ferry, George, said I, as we neared the old spot we had visited so many times before. So the yacht is swung into the wind, and presently we land. The servants are going about the place more quietly than usual, and we of course inquire the cause. We learn that our old friend the host is upstairs ill, and that for the first time for many years he is not able to be amongst the pheasants on the opening day of the shooting. We express the hope that he will soon be better, and our friend having, of course, subscribed the visitor's book, we continue our journey up the river. From Horning upward, the Bure is beautifully wooded. Now and again one catches a glimpse of some broad through the trees, but on the present occasion we did not stay to explore them. Once we caught a puff of wind which caused the yacht to careen so suddenly that the water poured over the combings into the well. The jib sheets were, however, eased off too quickly to allow of any serious mishap. "'What a very charming country we are coming to,' said my friend as we neared Salus. "'Yes, I like it better than any part I know. We'll stay here for luncheon.' So, on to the broad we sailed, and made for a large boathouse on the opposite side and under the lee of the slight eminence which borders the lake, we stopped. After resting a while, we started on a little voyage of discovery in the dinghy, and endeavoured to land on the eastern side. The high tides of the past few days had, however, rendered this impossible, as the marshland was sodden. Well, I don't like being beaten. We'll try somewhere else so we re-embarked and rowed to another point, where I was nearly sure of landing, but this was also found to be impracticable. A third attempt was successful, as we managed, after a great deal of trouble, to reach the higher ground beyond the marshy rond. Our visitor rather wondered at my persistence, but I had a little treat in store for him which fully compensated for the trouble we had taken. We walked along the circular path, which winds through the grounds, till we reached a rather steep little hill. Up this we climbed, and then I challenged my friend 
to tell me if he had ever seen a prettier view in Norfolk. This particular spot happens to be a great favourite of mine, and is seen to its best advantage at the end of April or beginning of May, when the trees are not so thickly covered with leaves as at a later season. What lovely blackberries! I never saw finer! And, indeed, my friend was right in his description, so we indulged in a feast of the luscious fruit as we wandered back to the river, and then gathered a quantity of the finest clusters to take back to the yacht. It happens that the part of the river where we found this fruit is called the Black Current Reach, but as we embark once again, we both declare that Blackberry Reach would be a much more appropriate name. On our return to the yacht, we found both Jack and George busy cleaning and dissecting the leveret we shot the day before, and generally making preparations for a first-rate stew for our dinner later on. I am afraid I may have given too much prominence to this item of our cookery, and solemnly promise not to again refer to it. This must not, however, prevent me from telling of a little mishap which befell us on this occasion. When the leveret was quite prepared for the saucepan, nothing would satisfy John but to throw the various parts piece by piece to George, who held the yacht's pail for their reception in the stern sheets. We all warned him of the probable result, and presently one of the hind legs dropped into the water, and, of course, immediately sank. When again under way, I scarcely need say we chaffed him unmercifully, but he took our banter in his usual unconcerned way. The sail from Salus to Roxham Broad occupied a very short time and when once again on that lovely lake, we could not help comparing its appearance with that of a week before, when a dead calm held possession of its surface. Now, however, the scene was indeed changed, and the scamper across its ruffled waters was most exhilarating. We had taken several turns round, when our visitor suddenly drew attention to the bowsprit, which was bending like a fishing rod. A hurried inspection, as the yacht was shot into the wind, revealed the fact that the lanyards of the bowsprit shrouds had carried away. We therefore lost no time in making for the shore, where the mischief was speedily righted. What a lucky thing it was noticed in time to save the spar, was the expressed opinion of all, as we again tore across the broad, this time making again for the river, where, under the lee of the trees, we sailed more quietly to Roxham Bridge. That night when we turned in, the wind whistled through the rigging ominously, and used as we were to roughing it, it was longer than usual before the oblivion of sleep overtook us. End of chapter 13。Chapter 14 of Notes on the Broads and Rivers of Norfolk and Suffolk by Harry Britton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Roxham to Barton and Acle. Before we leave Roxham, I ought to say something of the accommodation of the place, as, next to Alton, it is the centre most frequented by visitors. It should be noted that the proper name of the village, lying between the bridge and the railway station, is Hoveton St. John, and that Roxham proper is on the west side of the river, although the station of the Great Eastern Railway is named after the latter place. Hoveton, or Hofton, as it is locally pronounced, is a great centre for Norwich fishermen, 
many of whom walk over on Sundays and spend the day in the most innocent of all recreative pursuits. A greater number still arrive by rail, and lucky is the man who gets a boat, especially if he has not taken the precaution to write beforehand. The great popularity the place enjoys is well illustrated by the crowded state of the railway station every holiday, when one can scarcely find standing room. There are two capital inns within three minutes' walk of the station, the King's Head, kept by Jimson, and the Horseshoes, by Whitaker. At the latter, great civility is always shown, and a capital stock of boats will be found. Yachts and sailing boats are also let by Mr. John Loynes, who has obtained prize medals for his craft, which are specially built for our waters. Beside the accommodation I have mentioned, and in addition to the Roxham Castle, there are now several private houses where clean and comfortable lodgings can be obtained. The fishing is free on the river, but if the piscator wishes to try his hand on the broad, he must obtain a ticket, price half a crown, from Mr. C. J. Green of London Street, Norwich, who will be happy to give any information on fishing subjects and to supply the paraphernalia necessary for the practice of the gentle art. I hope that tourists who may be induced to visit Norfolk will not take French leave to fish on the broads, nearly all of which are private. The riparian owners, as a rule, willingly grant permission, and I am quite sure there is a greater pleasure in obtaining the proprietor's order legitimately than in poaching on private water. I use the term poaching advisedly, as although there may be a great deal to say about the right of the public to follow the tide, every attempt to establish this has so far failed. It might, perhaps, have been desirable to give in this work some sort of list of fishing spots, or to have marked them on the sectional maps. On thinking the matter over, I have come to the conclusion, to quote Artemis Ward, that it can't be did, as their name is simply legion. Information is, however, willingly given at each of the several stations on all points connected with the immediate neighbourhood, and the capital reports in the Fishing Gazette and Land and Water, from time to time, will give a very fair idea of the best headquarters. Well, Johnny, my boy, we shall soon say good-bye to Wroxham for the season. I remarked as we both lay in our berths enjoying the last few minutes in bed. A long-drawn sigh was the reply I received at first, and then we talked of the events of the boating season, which would all too soon be a thing of the past. Altogether, it was voted to have been a very successful one, but we both indulged in the hope that next year might be even more so. Our castle building was at last interrupted by George, who had commenced preparations for an early start. Presently we heard the awning over the well flapping, and as this sounded really like business, we were soon on deck lending a hand. The wind was blowing big guns that morning, and although we reefed everything close, George more than once declaimed against the unwisdom of getting under way in such a gale. As we had, however, made up our minds the night previous to get to Horning before breakfast, we determined to make the attempt. Fortunately, we made a clean start, but soon found we had all our work cut out for us. However, we held on although the excitement was very great. 
every now and again a squall caught us and the little yacht seemed as though it must capsize or some of our standing rigging carry away as we neared the entrance to roxham broad we almost decided to give it up the water was looking so choppy say the word said george who had charge of the tiller and i'll swing her into the wind afore anything happens what do you say johnny i vote we keep on and chance it right you are my boy we are sure of the boom this time anyway replied jack and so the order was given of course all these excited queries and equally excited replies occupied much less time than it takes to write and when too late to retract our decision we wished we had taken our man's advice just as we reached the dreaded spot a squall which had of course gained force in crossing the open waters of the lake struck us for a moment the yacht seemed to tremble and then was almost thrown on to her beam ends the water pouring over the plankways and into the well luckily we had taken the precaution to uncleat all the sheets or our trip would have come to a very hurried finish and a wet one to boot now have you had enough of it asked george anxiously but for the second time we decided to keep ahead just as we reached salus we were again caught in a squall and i must confess to feeling a little bit scared i was standing forward when presently and without a moment's warning the water was pouring all round me and i heard john yell there goes the jib my order to lie to was anticipated by george and in a very short space of time we were out of danger real danger it had undoubtedly been and i have to thank a strong pair of arms for enabling me to hold on to the rigging on looking round we ascertained that no casualty had occurred and that it was simply the jib sheet running through the block that made john think something had happened to the sail from this point there was a free wind all the way to horning so we determined to make the mainsail snug and try with the jib alone comparatively tiny as was this spread of canvas we made rapid headway and reached the ferry without further incident breakfast over we set to work to put things a little bit in order as our morning sail had completely upset the interior arrangements of the yacht amongst other details we gave the cabin cushions a thorough cleaning these i may say are covered with crimson plush which while looking very nice has one drawback that of gathering lints we have found by experience that the best way to clear this off is to run them on clean grass and as there was a nice patch next door to the yacht we jack and i started racing up and down presently we heard a laugh and looking round found a bright pair of eyes watching us it appeared that the owner of the eyes in question had been amused by our antics for some little time and now inquired if she could help us this was of course quite out of the question but we kept up a literally running conversation until our labours ceased when we went up to the house for supplies liquid and otherwise i ought to have said before that the hostel known as horning ferry takes its name from the fact that a horse ferry is connected therewith this is really a huge pontoon worked by means of chains and capable of carrying even a wagon and horses across the stream i may say here that the attraction of this quiet retreat 
consists not only in its absolutely homelike character, but in its central position on the Bure, making all the lakes easily accessible for day excursions. I would particularly impress on any visitor that South Walsham and Ranworth Broads are worth rowing ten times the distance to sea. The first mentioned lake is gained by a dyke which empties into the river just opposite St. Benedict's Abbey, and although a comparatively small sheet of water, it is one of the most delightful of the broads. Ranworth, too, is very charming, and the church, which stands so boldly above, makes a picture not soon forgotten. The church, it may be remarked, contains a famous rood screen. Both of these broads are private, but a quiet pull over their lovely extent is not generally objected to in the summer, although fishing is strictly prohibited. There are a number of other broads within easy distance of Horning, which we did not explore during our trip, as they were so well known to us. Those who may wish to vary their stay with a country stroll should not omit to inspect Woodbastic Church, which is really a model country church and well worthy of visit. When we were again under sail, the wind had gone down considerably, and we enjoyed the lull after the storm immensely. A very prominent object in this neighbourhood, and one which stands out so boldly as to demand observation, is Horning Church. The river is of a very sinuous character in its vicinity, so that one appears to almost sail round it. Adjoining the church is the vicarage, and one cannot help thinking the occupier of such a charmingly situated residence has a very pleasant lot assigned to him. By about eleven o'clock, we reach the River Ant, the Bure's second tributary, and, under protest from George, turned up this narrow little stream. About a mile from the mouth, one's progress is arrested by Ludden Bridge, so we had to lie to again. It had been my intention to lower the mast and sail on, but the wind, happening to be contrary, our man declared it would be no use attempting it, as tacking was out of the question in such confined waters. Perhaps I was a little inclined to be persistent that morning, so I teased George by telling him I had turned down by moonlight two or three years before. He answered this with a grunt and a look of incredulity which suddenly changed to triumphant assertion as he declared his willingness to get the mast down at once. Now, this sudden change of front looked suspicious, so he asked what he was driving at. Only that you can't get through the bridge till low tide. You don't mean to say? Yes, I do mean to say that it's quite impossible. Come with me in the dinghy, and I'll prove it, said George. So we rowed to the bridge, and measured the height roughly with an oar. Returning again to the yacht, we found it would be a very close thing for the tabernacle, and, much to George's delight, we decided to give up the idea, but to row or tow up in the dinghy. As this would take us the best part of the day, we provisioned the boat with material for luncheon, and were about starting, after locking up, when a happy thought suddenly occurred to me. Borrowing the cabin key, I dived inside for note paper and pencil, and a book for desk. "'The governor looks like business this morning, Mr. Y, said George, as I made myself comfortable in the stern, and commenced writing." and, indeed, I felt like business as the sheets were rapidly filled with the occurrences of days before. In this connection, 
i might perhaps say that although i cannot claim to have a good memory generally yet the incidents of my yachting trips appear almost to be stereotyped on my brain so although my diary had fallen sadly into arrears i had no difficulty in committing to paper all that had happened although john more than once grumblingly asserted it would never be completed whilst i am at work with my papers a spirit of mischief appears to possess john who every now and again worries george with some antic or another until at last he takes refuge in flight making as his excuse the suggestion that we shall get on quicker by towing so for a time i am quite undisturbed and as i feel in form i am afraid it is rather slow work for my chum but at last i give it up for a bit of a rest the higher we get up the river the prettier it becomes and when we reach ersted shoals a famous spot for pike and perch more especially the latter we are much struck with the pretty little church of st michael perhaps it owes something to its position but i confess the view selected by mr george christopher davies in his first series of photo etchings is a very special favourite of mine at some little distance from the church and on the opposite side of the river the hull of an old yacht has been converted to the uses of an eel set and as we pass by forms the subject of speculation as to when it was last under sail a very little distance from the shoals barton broad is gained and a beautiful lake it is covering three hundred acres in the centre of the broad is a little island perhaps half an acre in extent to this we rode and as it was declared a capital place for luncheon we stayed for nearly an hour the view from this point is very pretty and extensive and just then was enlivened by two yachts one a cutter the other a latine the last name rig by the way used to be in common use on norfolk waters the enormous foresail permitted of the boats being sailed extremely close to the wind besides which they could be worked single-handed one very bad characteristic however led to their ultimate disuse this fault consisted in running completely under with a stiff stern breeze had i the time or space i could give many a yarn of the consequences of this ugly trick of theirs which a veteran latine sailor at stalham once told me the cutter i have mentioned was very skilfully managed by its one occupant and we were much interested in the evident practical knowledge he had of the different channels these are marked out by posts but to any one unacquainted with the broad appear as maze-like as possible when we started again in the dinghy for barton the wind had nearly died away and the effect of everything reflected on the surface of the lake was very beautiful once or twice i asked george to cease rowing so peaceful everything appeared and we felt sorry when we at last turned into the dyke leading to barton stathe where of course the view was more confined i don't suppose the weekly half-holiday movement has extended to barton but if so i should guess saturday must be devoted to its observance anyway the only living soul we saw as we rode to the landing place was a small boy on a wherry who was playing with a toy fishing rod and who intently watched his float with all the gravity of a much older devotee of the gentle art further along we passed a boat building yard where several wherries were lying in and out of the water 
but all these were entirely untenanted when we landed too we might have come to a village of the dead for all the evidences of life in the active sense that we could discover presently however a door opened and a healthy-looking lass appeared who seemed extremely astonished when we asked the time evidently she thought we were making fun of her but at last accepted the explanation that we had forgotten our watches twenty minutes to four she announced and we suddenly realized the fact that if we intended making acle we must lose no time in starting back so after thanking our fair informant we hurriedly embarked and soon the little dinghy was forging through the water at a very rapid rate when the first spurt was over and we were going more quietly we noticed perfect shoals of fish which darted in all directions on our approach i should say the fishing on barton broad is free in the summer time by courtesy of the owner and is easily gained from stalham a station on the eastern and midlands railway where boats can be hired and every accommodation found as we entered the river again i asked george to ease off just for a last peep at the broad of course he assented but warned us we must not stay long as we had all our work cut out so we started again but as a bend of the river shut out the view i could not help remarking to john that if visitors were not delighted with the scenery of our lakeland they must be difficult indeed to please the long row across the broad had evidently pumped george so i volunteered to go ashore with a tow-line and as i was quite fresh the labour was very slight as a matter of fact if quick passages are necessary i very much recommend this method especially if the towpaths are good the distance from the broad to the mouth of the river is about four and a half miles and when half this distance had been covered john insisted on taking my place shortly after this change had been made we came up with three or four donkeys and george suggested to jack that he should try and harness one to the line i scarcely need say this was attempted forthwith but all efforts to carry the idea into execution proved unavailing as every time the boat came near enough for john to make a rush for the nearest donkey off they all started i must not forget to tell of an enormous number of starlings we saw just before we gained ludham for some minutes before we reached the yacht large detachments appeared to be arriving from all parts and making a common centre in a marsh a little to the north of the bridge as we came up to the spot we all three shouted at the tops of our voices and the result was worth all the exertion a great body of the birds rose with a wonderful rushing noise which sounded strange in the stillness prevailing around so vast was their number that they seemed to resemble a heavy cloud and altogether it was a sight well worth seeing in this connection i would especially direct the attention of visitors from london to the opportunity they have of making a study of the ornithology of the broad district of course i refer to the grand collection of wild birds at the natural history museum at south kensington to which lord walsingham has so liberally contributed and to whom i believe the happy thought of placing them apart owes its inception i was recently looking through the collection and was particularly struck with the beautifully lifelike manner in which the subjects were mounted on boarding the buttercup we lost no time in getting away as signs of twilight were showing 
whilst one took the quant, another started on shaking the reefs out of and hoisting the sails. But when we once again floated on the Bure, both the day and the wind were nearly spent. As we slowly sail past the abbey, I may say that this is a very favourite fishing ground, and any day in the season half a dozen or more fishing parties will be found located here, and good takes are often reported. Somehow, as we draw on to our resting place, night appears to close around more quickly than usual, and presently we see on our left the pale light of the crescent moon. It is the first time we have seen it, therefore we make much ceremony of turning our money. I am afraid I must not attribute to this cause the fact that almost immediately after a nice little breeze sprang up, but certain it is that such was the case. As we passed Thurn Mouth, the old eel-setter wished us a cheery good night. As I have mentioned these eel sets before in the course of our wanderings, it may not be out of place to say something about them. Many a time as one sails along in the early evening on our waterways, these primitive Noah's Ark-like structures, which during the day have appeared quite deserted, will be found to be occupied, and as the yacht drifts past, the eel setter salutes although it may not, perhaps, be noticed by the unobservant tourist, yet the eel-catcher has not emerged from his hut for the sole purpose of speaking the wherry or yacht. The fact is, his nets demand unceasing attention, or they would soon be destroyed. They consist of a wall of fine mesh net, stretched quite across the river, fastened by ropes to stakes on either bank, the bottom being kept down by means of lead sinkers, and the upper line supported by cork floats. As the streams are navigable, the net has to be sunk to the bottom on the approach of a wherry. This is done by means of three lines attached to the top line, and led through blocks fixed to stakes at the bottom of the water to the eel-setter's hut on the shore. By hauling on these lines, the net is sunk to the bottom, and the craft passes over without injuring the nets, after which it is raised to the surface again. In this long wall of net are three or four openings, to which purse-nets about eighteen feet long stretched on hoops like bow-nets, are attached, the far end being closed. These pods, as they are called, are extended downstream and fastened to stakes in the river bottom, their positions being marked by floats. The eel-sets are worked at night during the autumn months and when the fish are running to the sea. Therefore, of course, only while the water is ebbing. I have quite lately had a long chat with the proprietor of the eel set at Thurn, and he was good enough to give me some very interesting details of his particular set, which has four pods. He informed me that eels up to seven pounds in weight had been captured, but that it was a very rare thing for any other fish to be caught. End of chapter 14。Chapter 15 of Notes on the Broads and Rivers of Norfolk and Suffolk by Harry Britton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Up the Muckfleet to Philby, Rollsby, and Ormsby. The early part of the morning of the last day of our trip was devoted to a regular clean-up. The sails, although we had decided to dispense with their use throughout the day, were hoisted and given a thorough airing. 
as the heavy dews of the night before had made them very damp. Along the boom we hung numerous towels and other things to dry, and one way and another were not surprised at several wherrymen calling out as they passed that they supposed it was washing day. I should say that all this took place before breakfast, after which we walked to the village for letters. To our surprise, however, none had arrived for us, although we had expected to hear from our mutual friend, Braddy, who, it will be remembered, spent the first day with us. Why not wire and ask him to come? suggested John. The same idea had also occurred to me, so we telegraphed him to start by next train. On returning to the village about two hours later, we were met by the bus, but, to our surprise, Braddy was not amongst the occupants. The driver, however, handed us a letter from our missing friend, who therein expressed his regret that another engagement would prevent his turning up. As I have already remarked, we did not intend using our canvas, and I dare say some may have wondered what in the world we proposed doing with ourselves during the day. The fact is, we were bound on a journey to a section of the Broad District, drained by a tiny channel called the Muck Fleet, which I have referred to elsewhere. This dike empties between Stokesby and Acle, and is so small that only the very smallest craft can get up. It happened that I had never explored this diminutive waterway, although the broads of which it formed the outlet were well known to me. By reference to the map, it will be seen that the muck fleet runs into the river some distance from Acle Bridge, and the first part of it is parallel with the bridge reach. In order to save this row, we determined on taking the dinghy out of the water and striking across country for the fleet. The tiny dotted line on the sectional map will show our route. Many a time since, in recalling the adventures of that day, I have enjoyed a laugh at our struggles to get the boat along. We eventually succeeded in gaining our end, and the amount of labour expended was certainly far less than the more usual plan would entail. So if any of my readers follow in our footsteps, they may rely on a saving of both time and effort. At the point where we launch the dinghy, the little stream is crossed by a substantial wood bridge, and the view from this is very pretty, as a long belt of trees borders the eastern side. After pushing our way under the bridge, which was very easily accomplished, George went ashore with a tow line, and we bowled along in fine style. Presently we came to another obstacle in the shape of a bridge, and here the first real difficulty met us. Adopting the same tactics as previously used, we lay down flat in the boat and endeavoured to pull through. Imagine our feelings when halfway under we stuck fast. Here was a nice muddle to be landed in, and to make matters worse, George was roaring with laughter above our heads. How we both wished we had taken the line. After struggling for some little time, John proposed that we should rest a while and refresh ourselves with a glass of beer, a proposition to which I readily assented. So we filled our glasses and, much to George's disgust, drank to his very good health. When we again attempted to proceed, we hit upon the plan of getting George to force the boat down with an oar through one of the spaces between the planks. The first trial of this proved a failure, but a second effort 
resulted in our just freeing ourselves the third fixed obstacle is a footbridge and its negotiation is a comparatively easy matter although a certain amount of jamming has to be gone through the higher we got up the dyke the more shallow it became and it was deemed advisable for a second man to leave the boat so as to lighten it john elected to go ashore so i was the sole occupant and a not altogether comfortable position it was as we kept stirring up the mud to such an extent that sometimes the stench was almost unbearable i'm blessed if we're not coming to another bridge said john presently but it proved on nearer inspection to be simply a plank thrown across which could easily be lifted as we neared the first of the broads we saw some curiously small eel sets although the usually attendant huts were missing the most southerly lake and consequently the first gained by those who navigate the muck fleet is a fine sheet of water called philby extensive as this broad undoubtedly is it covers a hundred and sixty acres it is only a foretaste of the beauties beyond unfortunately we could not on the present occasion stay to explore but had to content ourselves with rowing across passing under philby bridge over which the old road as it is called to yarmouth runs we found ourselves on rollsby broad a finer lake than philby even pushing on we at last landed at the eel's foot which overlooks ormsby broad and fully appreciated the luncheon host monsey rapidly prepared for us although its name is not particularly euphonymous i can vouch for the comfortable quarters visitors will find at this inn the fishing is free nearly everywhere although one or two of the lakes are preserved i ought to say that besides the three broads i have previously mentioned there are four others and the angler who is also generally a keen lover of nature will find in this piscatorial paradise a thousand and one nooks to explore i remember once telling a young lady friend of mine in the fens who from her exuberant spirits we always called bob that the norfolk broads were the finest places in the world for spooning instantly she became serious and inquired what i could mean by such an expression i explained that it was a process adopted for catching pike and insisted that this and nothing else had entered my thoughts the very small second-hand joke unfortunately for miss robert was repeated by her to the brother of a future brother-in-law and for several days she was unmercifully chaffed this may have been a little too bad for bob but whether a field for trailing for the freshwater shark or the other spooning be sought for it would be hard to find a more suitable spot than the norfolk lakeland a term applied particularly to this section by the late mr frank buckland our luncheon over we walked to the sportsman's arms from which inn we hired a boat to row to the great yarmouth waterworks the fact that so large a town draws its water supply from this source will give some idea of its purity on disembarking about five or ten minutes later we were met by the proprietor whose acquaintance i had made a couple of years before for the sake of old lang syne we had a drink together and as we left i asked what we were to pay for the hire of the boat i would rather not say what charge was levied but from a calculation i have just made i should estimate the profit on the outlay at not less than eight hundred per cent 
supposing a similar charge is made to all visitors i advise any proposing to stay in the locality to choose the eel's foot for added to other advantages attaching to residence there it has a large garden stocked with flowers fruit and vegetables when we left this beautiful sylvan retreat it was exactly twenty minutes past three and we determined on pushing our way back as quickly as possible but not to look at our watches en route of the journey back to Acol, there is little to tell profiting by our morning's experience we did not make such a bother of clearing the bridges but one incident which happened within half a mile of the last of these structures demands mention nevertheless walking steadily in front of us for some long time were half a dozen bullocks one of which appeared to object to our monopoly of the towpath once or twice the animal stopped short lowing the while in a very threatening manner jack and i were both ashore with the line and when the bullock for a third time made a stand my chum hurriedly suggested that i should slip the noose from around my shoulders and watch what would follow with an unflinching front jack walked straight up to the animal which at the last moment turned about and made off but not quickly enough to prevent him seizing its tail the terrific war-whoop which jack gave vent to scared the brute to such an extent that it rushed onward at a tremendous rate and as the tow-line was still attached to the dinghy i scarcely need say mazer's position was not altogether a comfortable one all around the bows of the little boat the water was rushing like a mill-race and there seemed every probability that its occupant was in for a wetting when jack let go i must confess that i was so much amused with the incident that i laughed until my sides ached indeed to see my companion sliding along the smooth turf with his body at an angle of forty-five and now and again lunging forward as his feet came in contact with some obstruction but all the while holding on like grim death to the animal's tail would have excited the risible faculties of any one on arriving at Acal bridge we found on reference to our watches that we had been exactly ten minutes under two hours in making the passage from the eel's foot I mention this to show how long must be allowed for the journey, although it must be borne in mind that we did it against time, and probably two and a half hours would be a reasonable estimate. Although we navigated the fleet on this occasion, I strongly recommend any who wish to see this section of the district to rail from Potter Hyam to Ormsby and to hire a boat there when later on in the evening we left for norwich after wishing good-bye to george mays who had throughout the trip done so much to make our vacation an enjoyable one i must confess we were not a little sorry that our fifteen days journeyings on the waterways of norfolk and suffolk had ended of the general success of our cruise the account which must here close bears the best testimony and i will conclude by wishing that all who come to our district for their holidays may enjoy themselves as thoroughly as jack and i in closing the narrative of my trip i have one more hint to give it is that all provisions in the shape of grocery etc be purchased in the district besides the bother it entails to bring this kind of stuff from a distance i don't think it fair to local tradesmen many of whom now make a speciality of yachting parcels which are packed and sent to any station at a very short notice in norwich 
many of the large grocers will be found equal to any London stores, both for quality and price. I should not have mentioned this, but that a case recently came to my notice where three large boxes of grocery had been sent from Birmingham. End of chapter 15Chapter 16 of Notes on the Broads and Rivers of Norfolk and Suffolk by Harry Britton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Fisheries and Their Preservation. The author has noted that the fish indigenous to Norfolk and Suffolk waters are perch, tench, bream, pike, roach, dace, and carp. End of author's note. I have elsewhere hinted that reference to the weekly reports in Land and Water and the Fishing Gazette will give the best current information as to where the fish are on the feed. Whilst these reports must not be accepted as infallible, so great being the glorious uncertainty of things piscatorial, they form a very reliable guide, as they are written by a practical man who has fished the waters for years. It will have been noticed that nearly all the fishing headquarters which we passed on our trip are easily accessible by railway. Horning Ferry is one of the exceptions, but Mr. Thompson will send a trap to Roxham Station, four miles, to meet any train by arrangement. Those wishing to fish on Hickling Broad must obtain permission from Mr. James Nudd, who hires the Broad, which, I should say, is about three miles from Catfield Station, Eastern and Midlands Railway. Fishing in the rivers is free everywhere, and thanks to the bylaws of the conservators under the Norfolk and Suffolk Fisheries Act, there seems a probability that sport will improve. There is one point to which I would direct the attention of visitors, which is that, unless these waters were preserved, the sport could not possibly be so good as it undoubtedly is. Probably nowhere in England can better coarse fishing be found than in our waterways, and, in common fairness, those who come down and fish the waters, sometimes for weeks together, ought to subscribe to those local societies which support the watchers. The chief and parent association is called the Yare Preservation Society, and to this body belongs the credit not only of originating freshwater fishery legislation, but also of setting on foot the fishery exhibition movement. Lord Walsingham, the president of the Society for the Year, at a recent annual dinner, paid a high compliment to the valuable work it had been instrumental in effecting, associating especially therewith the name of Mr. I. O. Howard Taylor. Of this gentleman's work, I may have something to say in a future book, but for the present, I ask those who come here for their holidays to show their appreciation of his society's efforts by posting a donation to the secretary, Mr. C. J. Green of Norwich, or by dropping something substantial into the boxes at the stations on the river. Last year, the magnificent sum of one pound and a penny was received from the boxes, while of the 345 members of the Yare Preservation Society, less than a dozen live outside the district. It is just possible that many who in the past have spent jolly holidays in Norfolk have not given a thought to the matter, but I venture to express the hope that when next year's reports of the various preservation societies are published, 
we shall see ten times the number of visitors' names in the lists. End of chapter 16 End of Notes on the Broads and Rivers of Norfolk and Suffolk by Harry Britton